Head over keels. Actual naval stories. Smart Lieutenant. The fierce German battleship Tirpitz, supposedly hunted for convoy PQ-17. This information remained unconfirmed, but nevertheless, British cruisers were given the order to turn around, leaving the merchant ships defenseless. July 4, 1942, convoy PQ-17 was scattered across the Barents Sea and had a slim chance of getting to Alhangasc safely. German U-boats scoured the sea. The sky was full of enemy aircraft. A British trawler, HMS Ayrshire, together with three transport ships loaded with military supplies for the Red Army, sailed north. Leo Gradwell, Royal Navy Lieutenant, assumed command of this small convoy. Gradwell was an advocate by trade, but having a coastal navigation certificate, he enlisted in the Navy with the outbreak of war. He understood clearly that any encounter with the enemy would end tragically for his mini convoy. Gradwell had to think of something. Standing on the bridge of the ice-covered Ayrshire, the lieutenant ordered the crew of the transport carrying tanks on the deck to place their cargo in operational readiness. Bristling with guns, the merchant became a warship ready to repel the enemy. However, tank guns couldn't deal with German bomber planes, for which the four ships of the mini convoy in the middle of the frozen ocean were an easy target. Then, having discovered drums of white paint in the cargo hold, Gradwell decided to repaint the ships. But there wasn't enough paint, so the decks and combat vehicles were covered with white linen taken from laundry. Luftwaffe planes flying over the ice were unable to find the camouflaged convoy. Under the cover of rising fog, Gradwell's ships were able to sneak undetected towards Novaya Zimlia. When Gradwell saw the Soviet flag in the distance, he knew that they were safe. Of the 35 transport ships of convoy PQ-17, only 11 made it to Arkhangelsk, and three of them have the smart decisions made by Lieutenant Leo Gradwell to thank for that. Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another World of Warships livestream with me, Mr. Conway. We have a really, really exciting show for you tonight. Um, I'm joined by some really special guests, and we're going to have the second iteration of our Armchair Admiral series. And today we're going to be talking about the Arctic convoys, and in particular focusing on convoy PQ-17 that you already saw a showcase in our little video there. Um, we've got lots of these fantastic videos. Uh, check out our YouTube channel if you want to see more. Um, let me introduce my uh, co-host, Mr. Taki. Hello, Taki. How are you doing? Uh, hello, Fox. Uh, I'm doing fine. And uh, I'm glad to be on the second installment of this uh, streaming experience. I think uh, we have a, yeah, we have a lot of nice assets. We have two very good uh, guests, and uh, we have a pretty interesting topic to cover. Yes, we have the best guests. Yes, and the best words. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's say hello to them. Hello, guys. It's nice to have you back again. Which I have returned. History <laughs> brownie point to anybody who catches the reference. <laughs> Indeed. And hello again as well from me. <laughs> yes. So if you guys uh, happen to live under like a YouTube rock and you don't know who these guys are, on your wait a second left, yes, um, is the mighty Jingles, um, who uh, does things on YouTube. You should go follow him. And to the right is Drakinefel probably the most prolific ship nerd on YouTube. Mm -hmm. If you need to know anything about any ship, uh, he will likely have a video guide on it and you'll learn all about it. Uh, he's, his channel is excellent. Um, you should go yes. and uh, subscribe to both these people. Fantastic. Now, um, before we dive into actually talking about Convoy PQ-17, because I always leave like the planning of these episodes a little bit to these guys because they know more about ships than me, why did we choose to talk about Arctic Convoys and PQ-17 today? Well, I think uh, probably the ma main reason is that uh, we are always trying to pick like a monthly theme and the uh, Convoy PQ-17 shenanigans happened in July. So that that's basically it. That's the main reason why we are 
picking the PQ17. We had uh, other interesting topics in the store, uh, for example, Operation Catapult, but uh, yeah, we I, I think we will reach them in due time as well. There's, yeah, there's plenty, there's, that's the good thing about history. There's plenty of it. Yes. There's, and there's always getting to be more of it. <laughs> yeah, it yes, that's up. true. But the, the, I mean, not, not the history that we're talking about, luckily, right? Okay, so who would like to give the guests, who are the, the viewers who don't know anything about Arctic Convoys or PQ-17, like a rough uh, TLDR of um, what is the Arctic Convoy, why is the Arctic Convoy, where did it go from, and where to, and, and where from? Well... well Jingles, so, volunteers, ooh. fantastic. Well, in a nutshell, um, in the summer of 1941, Russia suddenly developed an extremely large and German-shaped uh, problem. Um, <laughs> and while they'd largely been mostly uninterested in World War II up until that point, other than trying and failing to uh, annex large parts of Finland, uh, they suddenly decided that they were best buds with Britain and America. <laughs> um, please, please send us lots and lots of help. Uh, which they, of course, denied ever needing afterwards, uh, in the shape of the Arctic convoys. Um, aid was being sent to Russia uh, through the Asian route in, I believe it was Iran, uh, but it was uh, an yep. extremely long route, and it was, it was yeah, it difficult. Was, it was slightly inconvenient because there was no railway and only, at least at the beginning, only dust roads across the mountains. So. Like yes. basically everything you were shipping through there either had to go on its own, like tanks and stuff, which yeah. isn't really too good for them, mm. or it had to be loaded on trucks and unloaded from trucks. And uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and then there was a second route that was uh, theoretically shortest, but uh, it had a little, little tiny problem called Japan. So yeah, like basically. Although um, the rush, not a lot of people know this, uh, but the Russians did do their own convoys from the USA across the yep. Pacific, because Russia ah. was never at war with Japan until after they yes. finished with Germany, and then quickly declared war on Japan for as long as it took to loot the entire contents of Manchuria and then <laughs> get back over the Russian border. Um, uh, yeah, the, the the convoys from the US uh, included also US ships sailing under the Soviet flag. Yes. Uh, because, well, the Japan, I mean, I mean, they were trying to, like, they were kind of maintaining the ballots because they didn't want to... Uh, too much uh, tick off Germany by not going after these uh, supplies, but they also didn't want to tick off uh, the USSR uh, by going after them, so they sunk something here and there, but uh, they yeah. tried not to overdo it. The uh, only downside to, what... of all of that was, was obviously it meant that if you, once you delivered everything to the, uh, the Russian Pacific coast, you now have to cross, cross pretty much the entirety of Russia to get, get yes. to anywhere that is actually yeah. useful, which includes that wonderful area known as Siberia. Uh, yeah, even yeah, though not, where not, not, this, not, not uh, an easy route, right? Yeah, where this route was uh, useful was uh, for supplying uh, fairly large amounts of American planes to Soviet Union because uh, there was a air bridge established between Alaska and uh, the Far East, basically flying, especially Air Cobras and Key Cobras, yeah. uh, over. Uh, the but, other downside with the land route through Iran was that it took more fuel to send fuel on that route than you could carry yeah. and deliver at the other end. Yeah. Oh. There's a guy in chat called Commander uh, Johannesson who says he's spent his whole working co career in the Barents Sea. Um, uh, stick around. Maybe we, 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 you can help us with some things later. Yeah. Um, because That's I know great, that, 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 that some of you are here for bonus codes. Uh, we do also have a bonus code. Um, let me just really quickly chat, right? Like, calm down, bonus code, right? So this is, this is today's bonus code. Um, it's a fantastic little German word in the tradition of uh, trying to teach you some excellent German words. This is another excellent German word. Now, um, Drahtesel, um, uh, Mr. Jingles, can you guess what Drahtesel is? Okay, I'll translate it for you literally, right? It's iron donkey or wire donkey. What do you think it refers to? I have a the wire faintest, donkey. I haven't got the faintest idea. We'll see if Akazuki does. Akazuki, what's a wire donkey? Now stop, stop sniffing Zhu's bum. Answer the question. No, no. Okay. One word for me, and she does whatever she likes. Chukinefell? What's what's your guess? What does a drat is? I mean, why a why a donkey? Something that's extremely stubborn. No, it's a bicycle. <laughs> Come on. Why? <laughs> why a donkey? Okay. It's a donkey made of wire, right? It gets you where you need to go. Okay, fantastic. Don donkey's so well known for being the, the the world's first two wheeled animal. 
Yep. Yes, sort of. It's, I'm not saying it makes much sense, but it's a fantastic <laughs> word. Um, so, guys, this activates a mission in game, right? If you already activated yesterday's bonus code, this code will do nothing for you. If you haven't, it'll give you a mission. It'll give you German destroy uh, get German um, aircraft carrier early access container. Um, go complete it. You can find it in your yeah. combat mission tab. Anyway, back to the program. Yes. So, so Arctic convoys uh, happened, right? Supplies needed to get there. Now and we have they needed to get there fast. Yes. Well, the so fastest we have way was via the Arctic convoy route because uh, yeah. there were two principal ports, Archangel and Murmansk. Archangel, better port, iced up for large portions of the year. Murmansk was the only open water port they had that wasn't blocked off by ice all the time. Yeah. So, 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 so we have a little, we, we have uh, two excellent videos actually for in our Naval Legends series on YouTube and we've uh, cut a few snippets out of these so that you can see what this route actually is, right? So we'll, we'll, we'll tell you a little bit about how these convoys worked. Um, specifically also about Art Air Convoy PQ-17, and then we'll get into some questions and, and discuss the things, right? So let's have a look at how, how ships got there. To I deliver to, the supplies to, to the front line, line as quickly as possible, the Allies decided to use a naval route to the ports of Murmansk and Arhangelsk through the Greenland and Barents Seas. The convoys were formed in Iceland, in the Kalvijor, or Reykjavik, as well as in northern Scotland at the Loch Eu base. Depending on the ice conditions, the route lay either to the north or south of Bear Island, in a very narrow corridor between Svalbard and the Norwegian coast. The final destination points for the convoys were the ports of Murmansk, Arhangelsk, and Morlatovsk. A cruise like this lasted for 10 to 14 days. Yep. So you can see it, it goes through a, a pretty un, un, inhospitable, frigid... Yeah, it's uh, inhospitable, it's cold, and it's also pretty close to Norway, which was occupied by Germany at the time. And we'll that was... A lot lots area. and lots of aircraft. And, yeah, and that, that was another problem with, uh, with Murmansk as a port, because while it's ice-free the entire year, it was also in very comfortable range for German bombers. So yes, the German, the fact, the closest German airfield in northern Norway was actually only seventy miles away from Murmansk. Yeah, they, they suffered daily bombing raids. Yeah, so on on route, um, the Arctic convoys had to deal, you know, like not just with adverse uh, environment, but uh, you know, we've we've got a little clip here to to show this, so you can see what the conditions were like on these ships. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. Like, you couldn't pay me enough to get on all of those ships. These are Arctic waters. Even in summer, it's only four degrees Celsius. You won't hold on for more than five minutes. Hence, you must fight for your vessel. And they fought. Along the entire route, the convoy faced extreme risks. Storms and fog were frequent in Arctic waters. Ice was all around you. Huge lumps of ice would grow on the vessel's superstructures, and the ship could capsize if you didn't remove them in time. And don't forget about the German submarines, which could be anywhere, and enemy aviation. All this made the Arctic convoys extremely treacherous. Yeah, so uh, in conclusion, not a great route to go yes. sailing. Not, uh, not a pleasure cruise. Yeah, the, the icing, uh, I mean, there were uh, a lot of cases when merchant ships that were going with a convoy or even escort ship had to turn, uh, turn back because of ice damage. There were also two cases when uh, escort ships, they were both uh, wooden uh, hull whalers that were being transferred to Soviet Union to serve as minesweepers. They just uh, got so iced up that they capsized and sunk, like yeah. without warning, without survivors. Yeah, stability is a serious, serious issue. It does not take a, the, the higher up in the ship, the the water or flooding is, uh, the less is required to flip the ship over. And the thing about the ice, it's all very, very high in the ship. Uh, and even if it didn't capsize the ship, it could break off parts of the superstructure if enough ice built up. Um, it can seize your weapons up. Uh, it, it's bad stuff. It has to be dealt with on a daily, continual basis. Yeah, and, and, and of, uh, course, of course, a warship has the crew spare to do that. The merchantman sometimes only had a crew of thirty, and they just didn't have the manpower. Yeah. Also, got to bear in mind that it's 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 not just 
quote unquote ice. We're talking about sea ice here. So lots of salt in there as the sea yeah. is salty, which means that especially if you're a warship, especially when you're talking about the mid 19, well, early to mid 1940s, when radar, electronics, etc., are all becoming quite widespread on warships. The warship itself is actually quite warm, relatively speaking, compared to the Arctic Ocean. And so if you if the interior of that ice starts to melt off into sensitive parts of your turrets and your radar and everything, you've effectively got concentrated brine, which is going to be absolutely wonderful for eating away at practically everything on your ship. So that's yep. that's why those ice breaking parties on the on the deck, they weren't there because the captain didn't like them. They, they were there to make sure that the ship remained operational and, as Jingles mentioned, upright, both yeah. of which are fairly important. Uh, and I think... I think in the, in the circumstances where somebody did go overboard, um, because uh, being an Arctic Ocean, I think uh, water temperature is something around four degrees. Yeah, uh, something yeah. around that. Yeah. So life expectancy of somebody going overboard uh, would be measured two in two minutes. Yeah. Two minutes. Yeah. Okay, that's very. I was like expecting a, like five or something, but two. That's, uh, well, depends you know, what you're wearing. Yeah, it depends uh, on what you're wearing. Generally, it was with the, like heavy heavy clothing and stuff. It tended to be like up to 10 minutes, but yeah. basically it's minutes. Like if you are yeah. not pick, picked up within minutes, you have to be very, very, very lucky. Yeah, I mean, if your ship got torpedoed when you were in your off watch, so you're in your rack and at most you're wearing your pajamas, two minutes. If you were on watch uh, on the bridge, which were exposed, uh, so you would have had plenty of clothing on, warm weather clothing, a big thick great coat, sweater, um, maybe 10 minutes. But even then, yeah, that's that's assuming you could stay treading water wearing that amount of clothing. So either yeah. way, it, it was not it wasn't looking good for you. Yeah, and that's obviously not also accounting for the weather because if it's a flat calm, you might last a bit longer. If you've got high seas, which to be honest is probably the the mm, circumstance where you're more, more likely to go overboard. High seas, driving wind, snow, sleet, etc. That's going to steal the heat straight out from you yeah. incredibly fast. I mean, there's a reason the Shan Horse survivors wouldn't even feel feel a single mess deck. Yeah. Um, now, the you saw in the infographic earlier, it took ten to fourteen days to make this journey. Um, we'll have a little look at, 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 like you know, like what kind of ship we're talking about that made made this journey for the most part. Um, uh, you can recognize it in-game as the ship where you can pick up your containers, by the way. Yes. And, um, yeah, and what kind of formation they sailed in. So we'll go back to the video. However, in harsh Arctic conditions, the heavily loaded cargo ships couldn't sail faster than 10 knots. So the convoy passed by the Germans at the speed of the slowest vessel, about 12 miles per hour. The convoy's movement order was a formation with merchant vessels and tankers in the middle. They were surrounded by close escort ships. As a rule, these were destroyers, corvettes, minesweepers, and armed trawlers. A bit farther away, at a distance of several miles, they were accompanied by light cruisers. The convoy kept its distant covering forces, which consisted of heavy ships within 50 miles of its core. The escort ships were arranged in such a way that their fields of fire created a closed loop perimeter. Sometimes, two or three submarines were sailing behind the convoy. The ratio between escort ships and merchant vessels was one warship per two to two and a half transports. Okay, so now I have an immediate question for you uh, watching that. Why? on Earth would you have your covering force so far away? Because um, you want to intercept things before they get within yes. shooting or torpedoing range of the ships that you're trying to protect. It's like when the British soldiers on the beaches of Dunkirk complained that they never saw the RAF at all. That's not that the RAF weren't doing anything. They were breaking up the German bomber formations 60 miles inland because shooting up German bombers while they're bombing the troops isn't any doing the troops any good. You need to intercept them before they get into a position where they can do any harm. And bear in mind, you've got mul multiple forms of threat. So you've got the air threat, you've got the submarine threat, and you've got the surface threat. And so most of the convoys, at least for a good part of their journey, would have a close protection force and a distant protection force. So your anti-submarine vessels and your anti-aircraft vessels would stick closer to the convoy. But let's face it, <laughs> yeah, as we said, if, if Turpits or Shan Horst or 
um, Apple Shear or any of the others have got into gun range, they're quite happily can happily going to pop a few shots off at the merchant ships, even if they're also fighting the escorts. So those that distant cover of force, which is primarily there to deal with the heavy surface raiders, they've got to be far enough away that they can intercept, meet, engage, and hopefully destroy or drive off any raiders without those raiders getting anywhere close to the convoy. Because the other factor as well is that even if you manage to drive off a heavy surface raider, if it gets within visual range of a convoy, they now have an exact fix on where that convoy is, which means you'll be seeing the Luftwaffe in a couple of hours. And uh, another reason for the covering force to be relatively far away from the convoy was that there was also, well, basically, they would have liked if uh, Tirpitz came out and played, because that was one of the biggest problems with uh, sinking Tirpitz, like catching it somewhere where it can be sunk. Uh, and if the heavy cover force would be too close, then uh, probably Tirpitz wouldn't even try and come to come out to play. So, Couldn't they just drive a battleship down the fjord? Um, uh, they, they did it in 1940, but... Uh, it was uh, the war spite. Yes. <laughs> and it single-handedly sunk a third of the, German, the entire German Navy's destroyer force. <laughs> yep. Yeah, the, the main uh, problem you have with um, driving a battleship down a fjord when there's another battleship waiting for you is that, that those kind of ranges armor basically would mean nothing yeah. and accuracy would be almost near enough guarantee because it would be a flat shoot and given that the fact that the obviously it's kind of home field advantage for the germans they can have spotters on the on the mountain tops they can have they're probably going to have air superiority etc that means that Tirpitz is going to be waiting for you to come around the corner with its entire main battery pointed at you and in that Top kind of scenario yeah, seconds that's that's, with... a, that's even assuming you make it that far because yeah. trust me the approach will be mined mines okay. torpedoes uh, aircraft <laughs> and and even the rocks because i mean it was uh, bad enough even with the home field advantage uh, in the operation that the uh, kriegsmarine planned to intercept the pq17 it was uh, it was supposed to be quite a big operation with turpits uh, hipper uh, Sheer, Admiral Sheer and Lutso and a lot of destroyers. And just on the way wow. through the fjords, uh, three of the destroyers and Sheer run aground. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So, like, yeah, you don't want to really get into that area. I definitely wouldn't want to be the captain having to explain to High Command that I've uh, beached. I don't think that yeah. probably probably didn't go well. Okay, cool. So, um, do you do you want to, to say a little bit about PQ seventeen uh, before we have a look at our yeah, like, like the first 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 uh, contact with the enemy that PQ seventeen yeah. had? Uh, I I uh, just quickly recap uh, basically the start of the convoys. Probably I think uh, the uh, British gentleman will then take over when uh, we get to action because basically first convoy t for the USSR sailed already in August nineteen forty one. It was the Operation Dervish. It consisted of six merchant ships, which went to Arkhangelsk, carried hurricanes, which were like the most important cargo, and the convoy was not attacked. For one, the Kriegsmarine didn't really expect it uh, so early, and uh, also uh, basically the German High Command thought that the USSR will collapse anyway, so like no, no need to try to go into Arctic and do some mischief there, because like, I mean, it's it's area where you don't go unless you really, really have to. And uh, the following convoy, the uh, PQ-1, uh, from uh, initials of uh, an officer in the staff who was planning these convoys, uh, was sailing in September, end of September, and again, it wasn't attacked. In fact, the first convoy to be attacked was uh, uh, PQ-7A, where... Uh, Transport ship was sunk, and that was in uh, December 1941, uh, end of December. So basically for half a year, the convoys were passing without any opposition, apart from uh, obviously the weather itself, which was kind of good because they started in the summer, and there's one big problem of the Arctic summer. It's that there's always light, which makes it kind of easy to find ships. But obviously, once the Germans realized that the USSR wouldn't go down peacefully quickly, uh, they started focusing on the northern route on the convoys, because for one, it was the only route they can try to intercept, and for two, as we mentioned, it was fastest and, uh, and stuff. And then it started getting very, very costly for the Allies. Hmm. 
I think, uh, yeah, I, I think I can hand over to those more knowledgeable than me. <laughs> well, you look at yeah, me. well, you've got to remember yeah. that the, the, the Arctic convoys, it's not just the daylight during the summer you've got to worry about. It's it's a very much catch-22 because daylight, 20, nearly, nearly near enough 24-hour daylight, perfect opportunity for aircraft to attack you around the clock. Not so brilliant for submarines. It's much easier to spot them. Submarines have to run on the surface to get into position. Um, and even for surface raiders, bearing in mind they're raiders, they really don't want to be tangling with the escorts. Whilst radar is present on both sides in various forms, it's much easier for a, a surface ship to sneak in and sneak close in the dark, especially with the kind of foul weather that you can get, which would quite often disable radars or give them false readings. So summertime really bad bad time to be attacked by the Luftwaffe but as the hours close in and it gets darker the air threat diminishes but the underwater threat and the surface threat actually increases so you're kind of screwed if you do and you're screwed if you don't yep okay well let's have a look at uh, PQ-17's first contact with the enemy The first week went by without any incidents, and the sailors hoped it would stay that way until the destination port. At dawn on July 4th, convoy PQ-17 was spotted by a German reconnaissance aircraft. After midday, the airstrikes began. Bombers and torpedo aircraft approached from a right angle, but all their attempts to destroy the convoy were fiercely repelled. During one of such raids, destroyer Wainwright rushed towards the attacking aircraft at full speed, firing from all guns. The ship's counterattack was pretty successful. The lead airplane was shot down, and the rest dropped their torpedoes too early and scattered. Nevertheless, German aviation managed to sink two merchant ships. But despite the losses, the convoy maintained formation and continued on. Okay. Who wants the jingles? So, PK-17, yes. attack number one happened. Uh, yeah. Two two merchantmen down, but then then is when it get, gets bad. Do you want to shed some light? <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm. I don't know the specifics okay. of each individual attack. I mean, I've read on the subject, but um, yeah. uh, you're going to have to refer to somebody slightly more uh, with slightly more specific knowledge on the subject than me. Okay, to Kenneth. Well, well, if we need yeah, specifics. I mean, well. Uh, the thing was with the with the escalating attacks is that, and this is something we'll probably come on to in some of the specific questions later on as well, is that the Allied escort group, uh, as we mentioned before, you've got a close, close and distant protection group. So during the initial part of that voyage, the, the distant protection group, which is there mainly to protect against the heavy raiders, is still present, obviously standing off slightly. So air attack at this point is the main hazard, which is obviously what we just saw demonstrated there. However, as the convoy gets closer and closer to its destination, roughly around the point that they hit, uh, well, not literally, but hit the point where Bear Island is, then the a lot of the es escort group has to turn back because German air superiority beyond that point was rated as too dangerous for the heavy ships to go in. It was, it was too much of a risk of getting a battleship or a carrier um, or even some of the cruisers disabled, damaged or possibly even destroyed. And that in turn would leave the convoy a lot, a lot weaker. So the fact that at the point where the convoy's escort is actually at its theoretical maximum strength, you're already starting to lose ships. It's not a good sign <laughs> when, yeah. when going forward for the for the rest of the attacks because yeah. things are only going to get worse. Yeah. But, but as far as I understood, the the main issue was then that in, intelligence was intercepted that Tirpitz was actually uh, leaving the fjord um, on its way to, yeah. to go hunt yeah. down uh, the yeah, convoy. I, I, I think yeah. we will uh, get to that soon because that's like uh, is that later? The, uh, that's the fairly uh, critical yeah. point. The, the, because uh, yeah, this is all happening basically on one day. It's uh, July the fourth. The convoy is already on the way for a week. So the Germans are ready, the uh, distance cover is uh, ready as well. Uh, one thing also that formed a lot of the decisions uh, at that moment was that the, the Royal Navy actually suffered uh, quite serious losses just uh, prior to this, because basically first the HMS Trinidad, the light cruiser, uh, torpedoed herself. 
Nah, I could see see the sigh of exasperation from Jakenna yeah. Fell. It's like, <sighs> <sighs> yes. It's, they'd sailed without enough antifreeze. Uh, yeah. And that, that bit him in the arse. Uh, it, the, the torpedo launching mechanism had basically iced up. Um, the Germans had uh, quite a strong destroyer force based in the north of Norway, only 80 miles from the Kola Inlet, uh, consisting of uh, three of the Z-class destroyers, Z-24, 25 and 26. Uh, they had the misfortune to be picked up by the Trinidad's radar, who steamed to intercept, and the Z-26 took a fearful pounding. Uh, her engines were damaged, her rear gun turrets were unable to fire, uh, she was burning, she was slowing down, and as the Trinidad pulled up alongside her at a range of 1,500 yards, uh, the torpedo officer was instructed to fire. So he did. Two torpedoes stayed where they were with their motors running, <laughs> frozen in the tubes, unable to leave. The third torpedo launched, hit the water, porpoised, flipped, and came straight back at the Trinidad, hitting her basically right underneath the torpedo mount. Um, she didn't sink, but she was out of the fight. Yep. Uh, so, in the next convoy, I mean, Trinidad made it to Murmansk, uh, but uh, the Soviets didn't have enough equipment to actually fix her. They didn't have uh, uh, armor plating and uh, all the stuff needed. Uh, so, in one of the next convoys, the HMS Edinburgh brought all this to repair Trinidad. At the same time, in uh, I think it was the same uh, convoy when uh, the Allies suffered uh, quite serious losses to, due to friendly fire, because the battleship King George V uh, rammed and sunk uh, destroyer HMS Punjabi, and then two ships from the convoy escorts uh, sunk a Polish submarine that was part of the escort of the convoy. Yeah, there so, were submarine escorts for the convoys yeah. as well. The, and, uh, and also, don't forget when Punjabi went down, her depth charges went off yes. yeah. as the battleships that she was supposed to be leading were passing over, and that many depth charges going off right underneath even a thirty-five thousand plus ton battleship does tend to break things. Yeah. So this okay. was basically disaster number two. Disaster number three was HMS Edinburgh herself, basically uh, damaged by submarine first, and then wasn't the Edinburgh carrying? Lots the of gold. Gold bullion, yes. which was part of the payment that Russia was sending back for the supplies yeah, of the Oxford Exactly. I, I think it was something like 20 millions of US dollars back then worth. Yeah. So, a uh, lot more now. Yes. Rel so, relatively recently salvaged. Um, and yes. oddly enough, despite the fact it was theoretically earmarked to pay America, uh, the people who actually got the gold back were. Russia and Britain, because uh, the Americans had the losses covered by insurance at the time. So yeah. once, okay. the, once the uh, salvage was done, it was well, it was Russian gold, uh, and it was on a British warship. So we divvied that up between us quite nicely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's that's and that's uh, that's good. So but, uh, I think a few we we are digressing a slight, but uh, from uh, EQ17 nah, at this point. Uh, we are basically building the picture because uh, right. so that was Edinburgh lost. Then two weeks after Edinburgh, the Trinidad basically patched up quickly sailed but she was sunk by planes but basically aircraft attack and uh, yeah. uh, one torpedo hit basically right uh, across the old torpedo damage so basically she was lost yeah. so in a very short pe time period first uh, for once the allies lost uh, 24 merchant ships on the northern convoy duty and they lost quite a lot of uh, warships, either sunk outright or damaged. So this was weighing very heavily on the Admiralty, and uh, the PQ-17 was a very, very hot topic before she sailed even. Basically, she was sent as basically a political sacrifice to uh, uh, appease Roosevelt and Stalin. <laughs> Yeah. And it wasn't just the ships that were being sunk on the convoy routes. Ships were being sunk in Murmansk, which was basically nothing more than a fishing village. Um, very limited uh, jetty facilities. They had no cranes. Uh, limited warehouse facilities. Uh, all of the ships had to be unloaded by hand, which took, like, it, it, in some cases, months. Uh, Non-existent repair facilities beyond what uh, the Royal Navy senior naval officer present at Murmansk was capable of organising for himself uh, from the crews and engineers of the ships that happened to be there at the time. Um, and, of course, daily air raids, because the nearest German airfield was only 70 miles away in northern Norway. So once you got to Murmansk, it wasn't over. <laughs> so, yes. and, 
Yeah, and uh, in this situation, so the convoy was attacked by air, which uh, in itself the raid wasn't too like too devastating by the convoy escorts and uh, even the convoy merchantmen. They expected worse, but at the same time, they there were reports of bis uh, of turbids possibly sailing out of the fjord. Yeah, and that's where we are getting to the uh, big problem. Yes, the big problem. Let's quickly. Let's. The, this. This was the big problem. Tirpitz was Germany's most modern and powerful warship. Her mere presence in Norway forced the British to keep their main naval forces in that region. The battleship was used in military campaigns only at the direct order of high command. Yes, so the big problem was, of course, that uh, Tirpitz was uh, coming into play according to information the Allies got. Yeah. The, and it wasn't just the Tirpitz, of course. There were the three heavy cruisers, the uh, Scheer, the Lutzo, and the Hipper, um, which would have been a handful, but then backed up by the Tirpitz as well. And, of course, overwhelming air superiority. The air would have been thick with Luftwaffe dive bombers, torpedo bombers, and fighters. So uh, a bit of a handful. Even though it's entirely likely that the distant covering force, the heavy covering force, which consisted of, um, was it the Duke of York, the USS Washington? I mean, the USS Washington was easily a match for the Tirpitz. And they weren't alone. They had a bunch of heavy cruisers, loads of destroyers. Victorious as well, the carrier. Victorious, the carrier. And there was the carrier that, with the, that is thought to have been the deciding factor for the Germans to say, actually, no. <laughs> Uh, bearing in mind what had happened to the Bismarck. Uh, mm -hmm. If they'd lost the Tirpitz, it would have been unthinkable. That was basically the condition for the Tirpitz to actually get a green light from Berlin to sail. Yeah. Basically, th th this was kind of a battle that both sides were trying to fight by remote. The German forces were basically completely controlled from Berlin and the convoy and the covering forces were controlled from London. So basically the commanders on the spot had Basically, no no opportunities to no, no decide autonomy. by themselves. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I th I uh, think... the condition for the Tirpitz to get a green light was that the basically that the British aircraft carrier would be spotted and located like with a uh, hundred percent uh, accuracy, so that you know where it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they could base their plans on that. And of course, that was never really the case. They didn't know exactly where it was, so they didn't want to take the risk. Because the thing about the Tirpitz, I mean, they're called the, the Lonely Queen of the North. Uh, her, The threat that she posed was out of all proportion to her actual combat effectiveness. Because the Tirpitz existed, the convoys had to be protected by a close escort group, a distant escort group, and a heavy covering force. And that was a major tie-up of naval resources all because of one ship. So losing the Tirpitz was unthinkable. If, if there was any chance that the Tirpitz was going to be lost, turn it around, get it back into safety. Because even if it never fired its guns in anger, and the Tirpitz only fired its guns in anger once during the entire course, well, aside from its anti-aircraft guns, which you fired a lot, um, as both the Royal Air Force and the Russian Air Force tried to bomb it. Um, but the only time it ever fired its main guns in anger was when it shot up a Norwegian weather station. Yep. But despite that, the threat that it posed tied down massive amounts of resources and meant that every convoy had to be escorted heavily. Yeah, actually, yeah, the you've got to sailing. remember you yeah. don't, you never want to fight fair no. if you can avoid it. So the fact that you had two battleships, an aircraft carrier, and all their escorts there just in case Tirpitz came out. It can be interpreted and has been misinterpreted at times as the Allies going, oh, no, Tirpitz, look at what happened with Bismarck at Denmark. Straight Tirpitz will easily sink a, a single battleship. We must send out lots and lots. No, it's not like that. They were pretty confident that either one of those battleships could handle Tirpitz. But the thing is, they had more than one battleship available. Yeah. And roll the dice, yeah. luck of war, a one-on-one -on -one battleship engagement where the two sides are approximately evenly matched. And let's let's face it, any one of those three ships in a one-on-one -on -one has a decent chance against the other to say roll the dice one one unlucky roll and you've now a you've lost another battleship which is bad and two the turbits is now heading for your convoy which is even yeah. worse so why run that risk yeah you, you, if you, you have got the extra ships you put them in the convoy 
uh, in the convoy covering forces. Yeah. But it does mean that you have now tied down a significant portion of your capital assets and Turpitz is still only the one ship. Yeah. I mean, if you have two fists, you don't tie one of them behind your back when you go into a fight, unless you have to. Yeah. And uh, basically, Turpitz sailed against convoys earlier in the winter. It uh, didn't find the convoy, the distant cover force didn't find Turpitz. Uh, basically, they all passed each other by like 60 miles. Well, it, it was a uh, polar night, so like... It's probably not that easy to find something. Yeah, it, exactly. Like It's, it's kind of uh, wonderful that in these conditions, the British torpedo planes managed to find Turpitz and try to attack it, even though unsuccessfully. But again, it kind of drow drove home the paranoia the German high command felt about the uh, aircraft carriers because, like, I mean, we amusing, are here in the amusing, middle of the dark. <laughs> there's an amusing yeah. story about that, actually, because at the time, the fleet air arm strike that was launched against Turpitz was made up of albacores, which was supposed to be the successor to the swordfish, obviously of Bismarck fame, it actually turned out to be worse. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Literally, the only advantage that the Albacore had over the Swordfish was it had an enclosed cockpit, so the pilots and the gunners didn't quite freeze as much as in a Swordfish. But it was actually overall slower, less maneuverable, shorter range, and that did lead to a rather interesting incident that I've uh, actually read about in uh, Destroyerman's account, where during the run that the Albacores were making on Turpits, you had Turpits going one direction at 30 knots you had the albacores trying to chase only capable of 90 knots in a flat calm you had quite a strong counter headwind coming the other way bearing in mind this is the arctic ocean although it's not particularly great so their actual true indicated airspeed was ridiculously low to the point that one of the destroyers that was trying to get in close actually overtook them so you can imagine yeah. you're in you're in a torpedo bombing aircraft and you look out your window and you're being overhauled by a destroyer that um, doesn't obviously doesn't sound ideal. Uh, by the way, there's a comment from Kismet here, and he says it's interesting to see the Germans treat the Turpits the same way as the Japanese did the Yamato. Kind of, kind of, sort of, yeah. Well, For different honest, reasons. I think the Kriegsmarine yeah. actually make more use, tried to make more use of the Turpits yeah. than yeah. the Japanese did of Yamato, um, with about yeah, the, the same level of success. But <laughs> yeah, the, the the Yamato did come out to fight on at least two separate occasions. Yeah, but never okay. more than that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so um, then th but let's let's get back to PQ seventeen, yes. right? So um, Turpitz uh, leaves Fjord. Uh, allies get wind of it, and uh, then then is where things go. Well, I think slightly balls Pear shaped. up, right? Yeah. Pear shaped. Yes. Um, let's have a look at what happened because uh, this, this at twenty one eleven, a radiogram came from the Admiralty saying, "Cruiser force withdraw to the westward at high speed." The squadron of cruisers and destroyers, which were sailing in front, suddenly turned. The astonished crews of the merchant vessels saw them pass by and head westward. Now, I guess this is one of the most uh, or more controversial decisions, I guess, made, made in, in World War II. Um, it, yes. it, it it didn't include uh, the follow up order for the for the actual like convoy. Does somebody want to want to give some context on that? What the order to scatter? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, they 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 sent three signals. I can't remember the exact text of all three. I think I might have it written down somewhere. I, I, I oh, have it. Yes. Here. No, ah, I've, okay. I've, I've got it. The first signal sent at twenty one eleven from the Admiralty. Um, cruiser force withdraw to the westward at high speed. Hang on, westward. That's that's away from Norway. That's into the Atlantic, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. Um, Twelve minutes later, the Admiralty sent another signal. Owing to threat from surface ships, convoys to disperse and proceed to Russian ports. And then, just while everybody was trying to figure out whether or not that was some kind of joke, um, three minutes later, they followed up with another signal: convoy is to scatter. And the whole point of a convoy is you stay together for protection. And if you scatter, well, that makes you a, a harder target for the surface raiders, mm. but it makes you a sitting duck for aircraft and yes. submarines. And basically, and this, this, is, this the... is the catch twenty-two yeah. that you've got. Um, this is the catch twenty-two that you've got permanently on the Arctic routes because you've got to bear in mind that the order to scatter was not without precedent in terms of effectiveness. 
um, over in the Atlantic when the Shan horse had been out when you had, and also actually Admiral Shear, when you had the last stand of Raoul Pindy and the last stand of Jervis Bay. In both of those cases, those ships had bought time for the convoy to scatter. And as a result, the merchant ships in the convoy, although uh, the, the Germans were able to hunt down some, they weren't able to hunt down anywhere near as much as they would have been if the convoy had stayed together. So yeah. in light of what they thought was going to happen, which was Tirpitz and its escort group turning up, um, then an order to scatter makes a certain degree of sense when you don't have the, 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 those battleships there to, to deal with the problem. But it's one of these things, hindsight is twenty twenty. What they what they actually didn't realise was that at this point Tirpitz was actually already on its way home and yeah. as Jingles mentioned, yeah. you're just laying yourself open yeah. for aircraft at this point because now yeah. you don't have that concentrated AA barrage. And while the, the precedent exists, you also have to bear in mind that when the Scharnhorst and the Shear were on their rampage, they didn't enjoy the advantage of overwhelming air support. No. And the and my camera keeps autofocus <laughs> keeps messing me up and on the other side um the convoys that were scattering didn't have two battleships and an aircraft carrier sitting off 300 miles away and pq-17 did and yet they were still ordered to scatter uh, another thing about this this sequence of orders that was basically very confusing for the commanders on the spot and did lead to some uh more bad decisions was that basically the sequence of orders and the speed which, which, with which they were coming was basically indicating that the Tirpitz is like uh, right over horizon yeah. because yeah. first it was uh, cruiser force uh, withdraw westwards which, uh, west. uh, which the commander of the cruiser force took as like basically battle is at hand yeah. then you had uh, convoy is to disperse which basically would mean that the merchant ships were to like spread out but still yeah. had in oh, one direction oh, open open their formation yeah yeah but then immediately you have the convoy is to scatter so like run for your lives yeah uh, that, that suggests that the turpitz yes. is just over the horizon if you tell the cruisers to to withdraw to the west it's because the cruisers will get slaughtered by german heavy cruisers and the turpitz so the turpitz is coming convoy disperse Ooh, sounds bad and then three minutes later convoy scatter that's like oh my god get out of there you're all going to die that's basically when the commander of the destroyers escorting the convoys uh, basically came to the clear conclusion that if there is a naval battle going to happen immediately, he would be of more use with the cruiser force, basically as part of the battle line. So he joined his six destroyers to the cruiser force, even though uh, co uh, officers of one destroyer uh, considered uh, feigning engine trouble to, so that they can stay with the convoy, but uh, in the end they didn't go through with it. But the thing you've got, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I was just going to say the thing you've, you've got to remember is that the Trinidad, notwithstanding, especially in this kind of scenario, if you are possibly having to face off against heavy forces and you, you've, you've got light cruisers and destroyers, the enemy's got heavy, heavy cruisers and battleships, one of your most effective weapons is going to be the torpedo. And whilst British cruisers do carry torpedo launchers, destroyers carried more of them and were much better placed, especially in the Arctic weather conditions, to deliver those torpedo attacks as compared to cruisers. So yes, basically, the, makes this a decision, of sense. Yeah, this decision main, meant that the cruiser force would get uh, like 30 extra torpedoes, which was uh, not, uh, not a small amount. Yeah. And if you look at the contrast between what happened uh, with the light escorts for PQ-17, when they thought they were coming under attack from a massively superior surface ship force, and what happened to the even lighter escorts of Task Force 3 in the Philippines when they were coming under attack from a force, one ship of which exceeded the entire tonnage of their entire task force, the Yamato, which was also backed up by multiple other battleships, heavy cruisers and destroyers. And the Americans attacked, damned the consequences, and they, they won. But PQ-17 scattered and also had the advantage of a force equal to what they thought was coming 300 miles further off to the west yeah i think we have some questions actually about yeah. just just what led to this uh, we'll, we'll discuss a bit later but of course what happened um one of the stories of what happened after pq17 scattered of course you saw um if you were here in the beginning otherwise you can check out on our youtube channel the um what 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 what's the series called again? Uh, uh, head over keels. Head over head keels. Over keels, keels yes. um, the smart lieutenant. Smart smart lieutenant. Yes, where where he basically took off um, three of the ships. 
they hid in the ice, uh, found some paint in, in, in the hold, painted their ships white to disguise themselves, manned the tanks on top, on, on top of the cargo ships to turn them into like semi-warships and actually made it through in the end. But unfortunately, let's have a look. Uh, most of the uh, PQ-17 suffered a different fate. Yes. And I, I think think let's just put that into context in terms of what actually what actually was on those ships that that got lost. Yes, that's impressive. That's, uh, very impressive. Together with the convoy's vessels, 430 tanks sank to the bottom of the Barents Sea. To put this into perspective, in July 1942, the Soviet Army had about 400 tanks on the entire Stalingrad front. 210 aircraft lost together with PQ-17 accounted for one-third of the Red Army's air force that operated in July 1942 near Stalingrad. The Soviet Army didn't receive 3,350 cars, almost 1,000 more than the Stalingrad front had at its disposal. And, and don't forget, of course, that if you believed Stalin, all of these supplies that he was screaming for until he was blue in the face were of no real consequence, didn't affect the outcome of the war, and Russia never really needed anyway. But uh, apart from this uh, just pure material losses, the convoy also lost 24 merchant ships. That's basically the same amount that all the convoys before PQ-17 lost. All in one go. And yeah. On top of this, there was the, the returning convoy from Russia, which passed through without being attacked, because the yeah. Germans obviously focused on the loaded ships, not on the empty ones. But due to navigational error and the old maps and all sorts of uh, uh, things going wrong, it ran into a light minefield of Iceland and lost six more ships, plus uh, one mines minesweeper of escort. So basically in a Basically, in a space of a week, the Allies lost 30 cargo ships on the Arctic route. That was basically devastating. Yeah, and, and you've uh, got to bear in mind, put, put this in the, in the wider context of what's going on in the war at the time. So this is, you, you've got basically maximum need for merchant ships and warships, for that matter, on every single possible front. Yeah. Um, because the, the Mediterranean's ongoing, you've still, you've still got Mediterranean convoys you need to run. You've got the Atlantic convoys, obviously, the Arctic convoys, which is where this is happening. Um, but you've also now got um, the Pacific theater beginning to open up. So this is the point in the war, pre-1943, so pre when the Italians capitulate, that there's the biggest possible demand on every hull afloat that the Allies possess. And the, the mass building program of Liberty ships and Victory ships hasn't quite spun up to the levels that it would do a little bit later on. So to lose such a massive chunk of both ships and war production at this point is a much, much heavier body blow than it would be at almost, not quite, but almost any other time of the war. And don't forget that when we're looking at the number of escorts that uh, are assigned to these convoys on, on paper, it looks like a fairly impressive number. But not all of those escorts are actually warships. A lot of them are converted trawlers, fishing boats with guns and death charge launchers attached to them. Very, very good ship for sea keeping in the North Atlantic. But they're not really warships. But yes. They're what we had, so they're what we used. Yeah, basically one three inch gun and depth charges, and that's it. Yeah. Good good against U boats, not tremendously brilliant against anything else. Uh, there is a Question from uh, Nick has arrived. Would, have, would it have been better to split the ships in the convoy, convoy into pairs? Uh, well, that's uh, debatable. I mean, the Ayrshire's uh, mini convoy fared pretty well because they hit in the in the ice pack. But uh, some ships tried to stick uh, together for better protection. But uh, uh, generally, it didn't really help because the merchant ships had uh, usually very very light anti-aircraft armament. They had. Uh, 30 caliber, 50 caliber machine guns. The newer ships had uh, 20 millimeter cannons 
and or even uh, anti aircraft three inch anti aircraft guns but one gun and it generally wasn't enough and not only that but we actually saw it in the uh video clip the the cinematic that you showed earlier the very first section yeah. where a pair of ju-88 dive bombers attacked a merchantman and uh, i was quite surprised to see that they showed what the ju-88 pilots actually did the lead pilot would take the fire uh, and would fake an attack to draw the fire away yes. and of course the gunners um <laughs> would continue blazing away at the one target while the second one would come in and get the bombs away uninterrupted and you've got to bear in mind it's it's not just that it's one or two guns it's also it's one or two guns they're not manned by frontline navy crew trained in high angle anti-aircraft defense they don't have access to the latest fire control equipment they don't have access to all that other kind of stuff and again bearing in mind the, the time period that this is happening in the level of anti-aircraft defense effectiveness throughout the war goes up quite steeply but it's not at that kind of 19, late 43 to 44 level with VT fuses and all of that. It's nowhere near that at this point. And that's with full on warships in, in large numbers. So having two merchant ships, three merchant ships or one merchant ship, to be honest, the level of anti-aircraft defense you can offer hasn't really changed all that much. All you've done is, is offer the Luftwaffe two or three targets on a plate instead of having to go off looking for the, for the others. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, the situation got so uh, was so bad for the merchant crews that when uh, uh, one freighter was stopping by to pick up survivors from uh, the freighter Washington, uh, actually the survivors in their lifeboats lifeboats refused yes, to be picked right. up because they figured out that in the lifeboat they actually have probably better chance of reaching uh, safety than uh, just landing just another freighter. And I think in the case of the uh, crew of the Washington and the lifeboats, uh, they did. They they managed to make it to the northern Russian coast where they were picked up by a group of Russian soldiers. Yeah. Uh, there's a question from uh, Karl Dessaberger. Where was the Red Navy during the convoy? Uh, well, that's, uh, that's one of the other big pain points of the Arctic convoys because the uh, Soviet Northern Fleet had, uh, at the beginning of the war, only eight destroyers and uh, only, I think, three of them were the new Project 7s the Grebyashchi and uh, so on, and the rest were basically old World War I uh, refurbished they were, ships. They, they were but but French... guys, back in that day, the Grebyashchi could still stealth fire. She should have <laughs> easily been able to take them out, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, all, the, all the Russian and Soviet ships were sh built for short-range actions, yeah. more or less. So they didn't really have the legs to go too far from uh, Kola and they also had their hands kind of full uh, along the coast because they were providing fire support and uh, doing a lot of small uh, skirmishes and uh, stuff like that. So for the convoy operations they generally joined the convoys uh, some like 120 80, miles. Yeah. At the most, yeah. well, you've we got to bear in mind most of the German most of, most of the Russian shipyards that are churning out well almost all of the Russian fleet, but especially their lighter escorts, they're mostly based in the Baltic and Black Seas, yeah. both of which are completely cut off pretty much um, from them being able to redeploy. And so you've got to bear in mind when the Russians have X number of destroyers built, you've got to think, okay, so how many of those are in the Pacific? How many of those are in the Black Sea? How many of those are in the Baltic? And once you've taken into account all of those and how many are lost, etc., none of those are available for the Northern fleet. <laughs> so um, just because yeah. they, they have a certain number of destroyers doesn't mean they're actually available for these kind of operations because the, if there's one thing the Germans are not going to let the uh, the Red Banner fleet, <laughs> they're not going to let them get out of around Denmark because they control both sides of that particular strait and they're definitely not going to let them sail um, all the way through the Black Sea, through the Dardanelles, across the Mediterranean and <laughs> around the Atlantic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Any any destroyers that the Northern Fleet has, if it loses them, it ain't getting them replaced anytime soon. So um, we can have a little look because obviously, yes. uh, when once once it became clear um, that something terrible happened with PQ seventeen, I think some of the destroyers were actually sent out to go and you know like try and collect what was left of the convoy and rescue survivors. So we've got like a little bit of a, some some nice CGI, and then um, yeah, I think it's time to move on to questions soon. Yeah, I think so. From July 9th through July 11th, five merchantmen and several escort ships from PQ-17 arrived in Arhangesk. 
Nobody wanted to believe that only one-seventh of the vessels survived. Everyone still had hope. Those who went on search missions hoped to find the survivors. The people floating in boats and on rafts, frozen and exhausted, hoped they would be found. And they were found, almost all of them. Over the following two weeks, another six vessels arrived at Arhangelsk, both towed and on their own power. When convoy PQ-17 left port, it included 35 merchant ships. Only 11 of them reached Soviet shores. Yeah, and that was pretty much the end of convoy PQ-17. So out of uh, 35 merchant ships, 11 made it through. Yeah. Uh, just out of interest, the commander of the convoy, uh, doubting uh, his ship was sunk, he was picked up uh, of water, he then organized getting the ships that survived and uh, were hiding at Novaya Zemlya, getting them to Archangelsk. On his way back to the Iceland, uh, his ship was again sunk, he was again uh, picked up, and later in his career he was organizing the uh, naval transportations for the Operation Neptune for the Normandy landings. So he had kind of uh, a lively career. He had a busy job. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, are you guys happy to, to move on to some of the questions that guys have sent uh, in? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so, so I, I mean, we already covered some of them, but yeah, we, yeah that's yeah. true. We'll, 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 we'll revisit them anyway. So, yeah. I, guys, if you don't know how this works, right, every month we're going to have the stream, usually on the last Friday of the month, but uh, unfortunately, next Friday we are going to be on a boat having barbecue, um, yes. <laughs> which it, it fell on that date, so we had to move it, right? But um, we will always publish an article about this uh, stream uh, the week before, um, announcing the week's topic, uh, the, the next stream's topic, and uh, sending you out a little survey where you can ask questions. And then the guys um, in the week afterwards pick their favorite questions, the ones that they think are interesting, and then we'll discuss those on the stream. We'll, of course, also have some um, questions from chat, so if you have questions, I'll kind of add them to the queue and we can we can discuss them. There was one earlier, by the way. I don't know if you guys have seen it, but what do you guys think of Greyhound? The movie. I've seen it yet. I'd love to see it, yeah. but I'm not I'm not paying Apple. I'm not I'm not yeah. signing up for yet another streaming service. I've already got Netflix. Yeah. Amazon uh, okay. Prime, so I'll just uh, wait. What he said. The same issue here. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so nobody's seen it, guys. Um, they guys, yeah. they don't have an opinion on it, apart from that we don't like Apple um, streaming service. Okay, so question number one uh, was sent in by Tsar Nicholas II, who's asking, how were Arctic convoys named? Did the name depend on the direction the convoy is going? Easy one. Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, Well, we already covered so some, some of the um, initials were just picked, basically, semi-randomly from whatever people felt like picking at the time but the the general principle not just on the arctic convoys but on um a lot of convoys including the atlantic convoys was that once you had a, an initial set picked you just flip those initials around to uh, the convoy returning the other way yes so basically for the arctic convoys first it was pq and qp pq uh, iceland russia qp russia iceland or scotland uh, but after PQ-17 and PQ-18, uh, it was felt that, uh, for one, the name is getting a bit too transparent, and for two, it's kind of like a bad luck name already. Uh, so a random group of uh, letters was selected, and uh, it was JW for Russia and uh, RA for the return trip. Okay. Uh, this question here from Bogsy Time in Twitch chat, um, who's, uh, I think we touched on that already, but what kind of min-max thinking goes into the decision to abandon a convoy worth so much when such an enormous escorting force exists? I think we, we touched on this earlier, yeah. right? And the, the various, yeah. uh, if you want to give a quick recap. Um, well, I think we're going to be expanding on the reasons why, uh, or the political reasons why in, a, in another question that we look at later. But y yeah, yeah they, they assumed uh, that the Tirpitz was literally right over the horizon. Um, so too far away, or at least the convoy assumed from the signals that yes. they'd received, that the Tirpitz was right over the horizon and was going to start shooting them in any second, uh, which is what made sense of the uh, signal for the uh, the light escorts, the cruisers, to withdraw to the west and then for the convoy to scatter. Yeah. So uh, basically that, however, was not the case. Yeah. Yeah, so okay. basically, uh, to just answer the minimaxing question, I mean, it's a bit the uh, game term, but uh, so basically the idea was to scatter the convoy to make it as hard as possible for the turpits to 
uh, sync it quickly and to at least make it lose time while doing so, while the close escort and the distant escort would basically consolidate into the battle battle force and come back to slap their pits. Yes, that's, okay. that's basically what went into the what went through all the commanders on the spot, what went through their heads. And you've also got to bear in mind that the, the, the time involved, because if you've got the heavy forces 300 miles behind, bearing in mind that the convoy is still going east, um, even if all the, those following ships pile on, pile on the speed and head over, you're talking a day and a half, two days to catch yes. up. So yeah. if you think Tirpitz is, it's not even a case of if you think Tirpitz is over the horizon, obviously the convoy did think that, but even if you think Tirpitz is a day away, that's pretty much the same thing as far as whether or not yeah. the heavy ships can come and help you. Tirpitz yeah. did, did what, almost 30 knots if, if they pushed it? Uh, 30 um, knots, yeah. Yeah, 30, 30 plus, 30 plus, depending on the weather, obviously. Yeah, and um, the merchant we ships did 10. 10. Okay, yeah, 10, 12 on a good day. And also you've got to bear, bear in mind that um, the the Allied escorts, uh, the heavy escorts, on paper, they're slightly slower than Tirpitz already. They're designed for 27, 28 knots. And we are talking, as powerful as it was, the Washington and its sister ship did have quite a lot of problems actually maintaining their speed. Um, without have vibrating their sterns off. So you're actually talking about a combined yes. heavy escort closing speed, unless you really want to arrive with half your stuff broken and probably around about 25 knots, yeah. which just extends your travel time even further. Okay. So let's move on to question two. It's from Barkham Squirrel, and he's asking, with the convoys, how much did ice build up of the main guns, secondary and AA, um, affect the ship's ability to fight? Yeah, we, a lot. <laughs> uh, yeah, basically, if you didn't get, if you didn't stay on top of it, it would get on top of you, and you could potentially lose the ship. Never mind, lose your ability to fight. But yeah, as we mentioned earlier, in particular with uh, HMS Trinidad, Crown Colony class uh, light cruiser, uh, same class as HMS Fiji in game right now at tier seven, one <laughs> of the best ships in the game. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, that ended up torpedoing itself after only managing to get one of its torpedoes away because they hadn't brought enough antifreeze for the journey and their torpedo launchers iced up. Um, serious structural problems. Uh, the superstructure can only take a certain amount of weight before it snaps off. Um, and then, of course, all of that weight high up in the ship, the, the higher up in the ship the weight is, the less weight is required to cause the ship to capsize. So it's extremely dangerous and has to be dealt with. And when you've got weights high in the ship, um, once a ship does start to capsize, they accelerate the process. Yeah. So it's much harder to come back from it. Paradoxically, actually, <laughs> with the, when it comes to the guns, the heavier guns are slightly less vulnerable to the icing up because they'll all ice up at roughly the same rate. But if you're talking a six inch gun or an eight inch gun on a heavy cruiser or, or bigger on the battleships, proportionally, there's less surface area. And you also, if you chip off enough ice between the turret motors and the shock of the guns firing, anything that's really much left is going to get blown off by yeah. the first couple of salvos and you can hit the stuff pretty hard to get it off and you will need to because the ice is pretty thick whereas if you've got a uh, 20 millimeter say an orlican you can't just take a like a shovel and start pounding on the barrel to get the ice off because you're just going to break things and also there tend to be a lot more of them so it's actually a lot harder to keep your your light guns serviceable in that kind of environment as compared to your heavies albeit as, as Jingle points out, the weight is, an, is is another factor, and obviously the bigger the gun, the just just a sheer amount of ice on there at that point. So you have to keep everything clear, even though your combat effectiveness on different batteries may be somewhat different. Okay, cool. Next question from a not North, Notha Nothia. I don't <laughs> know. What was the greatest threat to the Arctic convoys? Was it the cold or the submarines? And uh, we have basically the same question also from BLJ 2019 from NA. So, like... Okay. Um, well, I think one kind of leads to the other. I'd, I'd say, again, if we're min-maxing the answer, I'd say the submarines were a bigger threat than the cold because the cold wasn't going to be that much of a problem because you're inside a nice, toasty, warm ship until you get, until you get torpedoed. And then the cold is probably what's going to kill you. So, I mean, they were both an issue. Don't forget, most warships at this time didn't have covered bridges. Insane <laughs> that, that may be for ships that are regularly sailing into the teeth of Arctic gales, but that's just the way it was. So it wasn't pleasant uh, being on these ships on the on the Arctic routes, but the cold wasn't going to kill you until you'd already been hit by the submarine. 
Um, I mean, you, you could ask the question, was it the cold, was it the submarines, or was it the Luftwaffe? The Luftwaffe, yeah. depending on the time of day or the time of year, was a bigger threat than the submarines. But the cold was probably was probably only going to kill you once either the Luftwaffe or the U-boats had already done their dirty work. Basically, that's also uh, taking the PQ-17 as an example. With, uh, with many ships that were sunk, actually the only uh, losses directly from the sinking were the engine room crew, the engine yeah. watch, which was usually uh, three to five people. Which is also why, generally, the for all the destruction, the convoy PQ-17 wasn't that heavy in the loss of life for the yeah. enemies. Although, uh, also vaguely related to the subject amongst the ships excuse me <laughs> oh god jingles <laughs> need to cut this stuff out uh, among the ships that scattered um they all scattered and some i mean it was down to the captains of the individual ships which courses they were going to take and there were a couple that decided they were going to try to take their chances in the pack ice because that would uh give them a better chance not only keep them further away from any aircraft that might spot them but also submarines tend not to like to sail around underwater in areas that are, where there are massive icebergs nine tenths of which are below this uh, are below the surface um and not all of them made it through the pack ice unscathed because icebergs and growlers are just as yes. big a hazard as mines so in some cases the cold was actually their biggest threat okay while, while you're here uh, dylan boyer on uh, youtube is asking he's saying well first of all he loves your content jingles and he has a question uh, based on your experience what would you say it was like for the people providing naval support to pq-17 are uh, the people providing naval support in what you know like the, i think the sailors he's talking about what was it like like you know like serving well it was different for me um you know, I, I i had I have done uh, towed array patrols in the Greenland Ice and UK Gap, right up there in the, uh, you know, the cold northern end of the world. Uh, but I wasn't serving on a tiny little corvette that bounces around in a wet puddle um, with fairly primitive facilities. I was serving on modern, you know, type well, modern when I was on them at least, <laughs> type twenty two frigates, um, which don't let the name frigate fool you. Uh, in the US Navy, a frigate was another word for a. Uh, what the U.S. Navy would refer to as a destroyer escort, or, or you know, basically a corvette-sized ship. Type 22 frigates about the, about the same size as a as a town-class cruiser. I mean, they were they were big old ships, and they were quite comfortable to serve on. It still wasn't pleasant when you're in the teeth of an Arctic gale, um, but it was it was it wasn't anything like what those people must have experienced during World War II. So I'm not really qualified to answer that question. I had a taste of what it was like, enough to know that I wouldn't have liked to have done it in a World War II ship. Okay. Absolutely not. Nothing but respect for those who did. And particularly I, I, the who weren't even in warships. I, I was reading a book on actually on the little Ayrshire's uh, convoy in preparation for this stream, and uh, uh, the commander of the Navy armed guard on one of the freighters that took the route through the ice pack was basically saying that the first time he slept... Uh, actually in his bunk, in the ship, in the warmth, uh, and uh, actually in the pajamas, not in full uh, uniform, uh, was when they arrived to Russia, because like before that he was just uh, sleeping uh, right under the gun and uh, like... Yeah. <laughs> No. Yeah, horrible conditions. Um, speaking of that, there was a question from Tim Mateos uh, on Twitch, and he would like he was asking what kind of merchant ships uh, were actually used. Was it all U.S. supplied Liberty ships, or <laughs> all if only, sorts of ships? If, if only it had been U.S. supplied yes. Liberty ships, it wouldn't have quite been quite as bad. I mean, the Liberty ships weren't weren't built with comfort in mind, but they they worked. They were reliable. They got the job done. Now we were talking tramp steamers from pre World War One, anything could be pressed yes. into service was used. I mean they're, they're, well, most of the ships were older than their crews. Yeah. It was just it was ridiculous. Yeah. For example, uh, the one of the freighters, the steamship Troubadour, was initially Italian. Uh, when uh, USA joined the war, Italian crew sabotaged it. They tried to fry up the boilers. The US Coast Guard managed to stop it, but the boilers had some lasting damage. So the ship was like able to do eight knots on a good day. It was coal burning. It had a crew that was basically a mix of all sorts of people who actually did a little mutiny while waiting for the convoy on Iceland. Uh, and like it was very, very suboptimal ship to run this route. And it's kind of miraculous that it survived both the way there and the way back. Okay. 
So uh, let's uh, have a look at the next question. Um, so again from San Nicolas II. Uh, he's asking how much did the extreme cold temperature affect steel brittleness and if increased armor penetration vulnerability of the German battleship hulls and our gun barrel or wear performance of firing um, say with U-boat hull and the vulnerability to, to depth charges did the cold uh, make the ships more more prone to, to, to break it could do it depended on the steel quality the the era I mean ships that are made of steel are always going to be vulnerable to extremes of temperature by the time of world war ii even with the older ships we have moved on a little bit from the 19th century where mostly using iron there was huge variability whether you're in tropical waters north sea waters or arctic waters um but th there was still some um sort of increase in in the brittleness but especially Weirdly enough, with with a few uh, more modern merchant ships that were present with the welding, because welding yes. was not a, it wasn't the precise science it would later become. And with the best will in the world, the best welders that they had were assigned to building warships in most cases. So that it, it, a welded merchant hull in the Arctic would be at a significantly increased risk of either just suffering weather damage that could open up the seams or the actual damage from an attack might uh, spread a lot further, yeah. a lot worse along that, along that hull than it would in, in um, other waters. When it comes to the warships themselves, they have the advantage of mass behind them um, and also it's, it's kind of an equal opportunities thing. So it's going to have slightly less effect on, on battleships slugging it out than it is on, on merchant ships. And with the um, U-boats, weirdly enough, although they are underwater and it is the Arctic, the overall temperature of the ocean itself is not going to be 20 below, <laughs> uh, if you're talking Celsius. Whereas yeah, if you're on the surface, it's, it's wind, wind chill and the air and everything, yeah. that is actually where it's colder. So the U-boats of, of all the ships present are actually the least affected by the cold, unless, of course, they happen to surface. Yeah, yeah it's generally because... the Sorry. armor wouldn't be really affected much even on the surface ships because basically again it's concentrated around water lines so it has fairly stable temperature. What would be affected by the brittleness the most are like the upper works and various uh, not armored but iron parts like yeah, basically equipment, derricks and uh, all sorts of stuff. It's funny enough, I seem to remember watching a video on YouTube from somebody, I can't remember his <laughs> name, uh, talking about late 19th century ironclads suffering significant problems because the armor brittleness was tested um, in firing ranges alongside on land. Yes. And, oh yeah, this armor's fantastic. And then you put it on a ship in the cold water and suddenly everybody's surprised when the armor starts shattering. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah. I better stop myself before I go off on one of my little engineering rants. But there's there's all sorts of wonderful phase phase shift and phase change yes. tables and solidus lines and all all this kind of fancy uh, fancy um, transition phases. But that's yeah, say it's, it affects iron a lot worse than steel. Yeah. Um, where those where those change transitions occur uh, depends greatly on the alloy that you're using. And remember, steel is an alloy. It's iron and carbon at its core, but with obviously random trace elements and such yep. like depending on what what particular type it is oh, so we've we've got him started now yeah i'll start reaching for reaching for my complex complicated <laughs> graphs <laughs> um but there was a question here um from john uh, josh thomas moore um he was asking how different was an arctic convoy to an atlantic convoy uh, colder colder <laughs> and you were at more risk of air attack yes basically permanently um, the the major threat to the Arctic, uh, the, the Atlantic convoys were the U-boats. The major threat to the Arctic convoys were the U-boats, the cold, the Luftwaffe, and the surface raiders. So they, and they the sun it, or the dark. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so yeah, rougher. I think rougher. And there's uh, this is a, a complex one. I have no idea. Um, Angelos Triandos is saying hi. Should the Admiralty have waited for more details from Bletchley Park because the first Sea Lord had a meeting with Norman Denning? Who said to wait? I have no idea who any of those people are. Pass. Uh, Don't know. Uh, likely it's... they should have waited for the confirmation. But uh, yeah, like uh, basically the entire decision was taken by Sir Dudley Pound, and uh, 
he died shortly thereafter, so he didn't really have much uh, uh, opportunity to explain his exact uh, reasoning at that moment. One, one of the things you've got to remember is that when we have most of the facts, it's relatively easy to lay it out in hindsight and go, well, this, this is where Tirpitz was, this is where the Allies' escorts were, this is what happened, this is what should have happened. But you've got to remember they had a fraction of that information. And when you weigh up the balance of possibilities based on what they knew at the time, the possibility was that Tirpitz and its escort group gets into the convoy, at which point not only do you lose all the convoy, you probably also lose a bunch of the escorts. And as, as we covered at, this, at the top of it, at this point, you can't really afford, it might it might be a, a valiant last stand, but you can't afford to lose a half flotilla of destroyers and a half squadron of cruisers in a valiant last stand at this point, if you can avoid doing so. Um, as, so and lose the convoy as well. And, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It doesn't actually benefit you Get at that ta in, in the overall strategic situation at the time, so you've got to make a decision, and you've got to make a decision quickly. And in this case, obviously, that means that the decision was made without as much information as potentially they could have done, which would have probably led to a different decision. But it would be a very brave man to sit there going, "Well, as far as we know, Turpitz is getting closer and closer and closer, and I'm just going to sit here, and wait." And see what happens because for all you know the next message that might come through is enemy battleship in sight bearing 175 engaging and that might be the last thing you hear from several several yeah. thousand royal navy servicemen yeah okay let's go on uh, question number six from vesuvius um he was saying if turpitz had sorted even somewhat regularly do you think it would have encountered any kind of success against the arctic convoys or do you think she would have met the same fate as Sharnhorst? Now we get into speculatory territory. Yes. I like it. Jingles. Um, it, it, it could have gone either way. It depends on the situation. I mean, Turpitz came... If it hadn't been for the presence of... Uh, was it the Victorious, the carrier? Yes. In the distant covering force? If it hadn't been for the presence of the Victorious, there's every chance that Turpitz and her escorts would have come out to fight. Um, and at that point, all bets are off. Um, with that, without the Victorious, would the heavy covering force, the Duke of York and the USS Washington, have been able to deal with them? Probably, but, but they maybe would have not. To chase them. That's... Yes. Um, if Turpitz had been had been sallying out regularly, um, that puts Turpitz at increased risk of being yes. ambushed, and intercepted, and sunk. And the one thing that the Germans wanted to avoid at all costs was losing the Turpitz. If there was the slightest risk that the ship was going to be lost. They just turned around or they didn't even bother sailing so but there's also a problem with the regular <laughs> sailing that's called fuel yeah because turpitz sailed in march it sailed around didn't find anything returned but uh, this sortie burned so much fuel that basically it took three months to replenish it <laughs> so basically turpitz was trying to sail as often as it could but that was like well yeah. okay you sail now now you yeah. wait three months but it yeah. needed solid intelligence to make it worth sailing. And solid intelligence wasn't always easy to get. I mean, they usually spotted the convoys at some point, but often they wouldn't spot the convoys and be in a position to attack at a time when it was convenient for the Turpists to come out and actually catch up with them. Yes. And you've, okay. also got to, you've also got to factor into account that even if you assume, even if for somehow the Germans somehow manage to get their hands on infinite fuel so the Turpists can sort you whenever it wants, there's also with regularity comes predictability yeah although we're only about halfway through world <clears throat> war ii at this point the allies with the americans joining in do have an overwhelming superiority of resources if they can bring them to bear and the more predictable turpits becomes in its operational pattern the more the allies can justify devoting rather significant resources to ambushing it in many ways not just the heavy surface force um, but also in terms of and whether or not it would have been effective, who knows, but in terms of lining up a number of submarines uh, on its outward bound and inbound yeah. course, because even if you miss it on the outbound course, it's got to come back. <laughs> There's only so many ways back back home. And you can just comment on the fact they were constantly mining the approaches. The Germans were constantly sweeping the approaches. It was it was a continuous effort both ways. Yeah. Um, so 
uh, one, one second. So the uh, show guide games was uh, asking uh, it, it, why didn't they just send the cruisers and the destroyers out then if they were so worried about turpets? Send the cruisers and destroyers out to attack the turpets? No, no, no. The turpets, uh, turpets escort force. Oh. Uh, so if if they well the the problem is that if you send out just the light forces, so maybe anything up to the size of a Deutschland class, the covering forces that the Allies can put together in terms of cruiser squadrons can handle that. Yeah. Um, the Battle of the River Plate at the beginning of the war has shown very, very with a very tight margin, but just what you needed to handle a Deutschland, yeah. and that bear in mind that's the Leanders and York class which are the diminutives yeah. of the counties and the towns and it's the counties and the towns that are running the, the cruiser covering force so if you have uh let's say Lutzau and Hipper show up if the allies have covered that with two or three heavy cruisers a couple of light cruisers and a flotilla of destroyers they'll quite happily accept those odds yeah. and, and the carriers and the battleships can be off yeah. doing something else that's actually exactly what happened at the end of the, well, at the beginning of 1943 or end of 1942, with the renewed uh, JW series of convoys the, in the Battle of Barents Sea, the Lutsov and the Hipper were intercepting a convoy, and basically it all ended when uh, uh, arriving uh, cruisers from the covering force managed to plant uh, first salvo on Hipper, managed to damage the engine room, and uh, uh, that was just like uh, so much risk suddenly because I mean the allies can kind of afford having uh, for example a light cruiser crippled next to the convoy because it it would get help there but yeah. Yeah. the Kriegsmarine cannot afford to have a cruiser crippled in the middle of enemy formation it's like yeah. I mean it's, don't forget and this was worth repeating so one of you mentioned it earlier I can't remember who so I apologize but these are raiders right we, we, we all play yes. World of Warships we think the Admiral Hipper heavy cruiser get in there and fight you know you're a heavy it was a raider its job wasn't to tangle with cruiser escorts and destroyer escorts its job was to avoid cruiser escorts and destroyer escorts and sink merchantmen mm -hmm. um, so any 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 battle where you've got the german raiders mixing it up with allied escorts the german raiders have already lost Regardless of the actual numbers of ships that yes. get sunk on each side, because their mission has been killed. Yeah, uh, Germany, Germany can't Germany can't reproduce ships really at this point, and, and right? So every loss is a permanent loss. Exactly, yes. and, and even heavy damage, because um, Norway Norway doesn't have the world's biggest shipyard. So if it's if it's really bad damage, you've somehow got to get it back to Norway, and then you've also got to somehow get it all the way back to Germany, uh, most likely. The, the I mean. Even back when the Kriegsmarine was being a lot more aggressive, back in in the very early part of the war, um, obviously you've got that the Scharnhorst and Neisen now managed to sink HMS Glorious. Now on paper, that's a huge victory. You've taken out a carrier, a couple of destroyers, but by the time the two ships get home, between a Castor's torpedo and a Lucky Mine, both of Germany's capital ships are out of action. The British have lost a carrier; they have half a dozen more. Germany's completely out of capital ships at that point until they can repair them. And that actually results in the Admiral who was in charge of that operation being replaced by one Gunther Lutjens, <laughs> who would then be yes. the one who took Bismarck out um, under substantially more risk averse um, orders. So, or, I mean, that, that both informs sort of this imbalance of even if you win the tactical battle you might lose strategically but also that's going that particular instant and that relief of command is going to be playing on the german commander's minds because if they see oh we're going to confront this allied escort force it's not just can we win against this force it's will i have a command when i get home because if i even if i come back with my ship in relatively intact with a bunch of shot holes in it no matter what i've done there's a very good chance i'm going to be off the ship yeah, and there was a question of Kilabin. He's asked it twice, actually. Kilabin, I saw it. Um, he, I'm not sure if we can elaborate much on this, but he's asking how much can can Admiral Pound's brain tumor to be considered to be a serious issue? Well, it's not going to help, is it? <laughs> yeah, but uh, again, it's debatable. Yeah, <laughs> we, we just don't know. It, it could have yeah. had a, it could have had a serious effect on the man's thinking. But it might not, and there's absolutely no way of knowing one way or the other. Yeah. To, to be honest, the, the single biggest sort of external factor if you like on on his thinking is probably going to be the ridiculous amount of hours he was doing at that point yes 
Um, as the same with the Atlantic convoys, actually, the Germans don't do a nine to five and then everyone gets to go home to sleep. The Germans are going to be attacking whenever and wherever they can, as much as close to 24 seven as possible. And the possi even the possibility that they're going to attack at any given point means that the people who have appointed themselves to look after the convoys back home are pretty much either awake or on their toes 24 seven. And that has a detrimental impact over time on your ability no. to think clearly and make decisions. So there was also a question from Serentinum. Uh, he wanted to know how did surface raiders actually deal with the convoys? Did they just sink them with guns or would they go and board them and sink them afterwards to save the life of sailors or maybe uh, like loot uh, valuables? And entirely on how big a clutch of ships they'd come across. Um, if they were in the middle of the South Atlantic, for example, where the water was nice and warm and there weren't that many naval bases for thousands of miles in any direction and the cruiser patrols were few and far between, then yeah, they'd probably point their guns at them, uh, make loud threatening noises, go on board, uh, replenish whatever supplies they had, take prisoners on board and then sink the ship, um, which is what the early war surface raiders did. I'm pretty, pretty sure that the, uh, the Graf Spee did pretty much exactly yes. that. Uh, the SMS Emden in the First World War uh, did pretty much exactly that. If you fa if you happen across a big, fat, juicy convoy uh, that's threatening to scatter, then you just sink as many ships as you can as quickly as you can before they get out of range. And somebody asked in chat, I noticed it on Twitch earlier, I'm sorry, I can't remember your name, exactly how far away is visual range at sea anyway? Um, at about 20 miles, you can yeah. see the top of the mast of an enemy ship over the horizon with a good pair of binoculars. That's far. Uh, uh, there's uh, Josh Thomas Moore uh, on YouTube. You mentioned the two forces, ships passing 60 miles apart from each other. Uh, was the Arctic especially bad for locating other ships? During the Arctic night, yes, because basically you have uh, you don't have sun. You have uh, permanent uh, darkness. You have some glow along the horizon that shows you roughly where the sun might be hiding, but uh, you, you don't have a daylight. So that, like, And that's assuming that the weather is otherwise clear and yes. calm. You've got to bear Which in mind in, that. in winter in the North Atlantic, it isn't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, re referencing another battle in the Arctic region, the Battle of the North Cape, um, whilst Duke of York used its radar on Scharnhorst, you've got to remember Scharnhorst got down to 12,000 yards before Duke of York illuminated it and opened fire. Scharnhorst had no clue the Duke of York was there, and that's a 35,000 ton battleship yeah. at what's yeah. effectively point blank range for the period. So you could, um, you could literally be the, the sailing within the equivalent of, of punching distance and not have the first clue that someone was out there if you didn't have the right systems. Uh, going, and basically the again, only, yeah. Sorry, I was sorry. Saying, again, a, a further example, right after Trin uh, HMS Trinidad had torpedoed herself, uh, a couple of the uh, friendly British destroyers arrived. Uh, one hung around to make sure that the Trinidad was okay. The other HMS Eclipse took off in pursuit after the Z-46, Z-46, sorry, Z-26. 26. Uh, yeah. Um, was getting the better of the Z-26 when suddenly the Z-24 and Z-25 appeared out of the mist two kilometers away and turned the tables on the Eclipse, who was forced to run away. And unfortunately, the weather took that precise moment to suddenly get better <laughs> and, and yes. she could be seen for miles. So yeah, the, the weather could have a massive effect uh, and it could change like that. The same happened, uh, for example, during the Battle of the Barents Sea, again, after Hipper and Lutsov retreated. Uh, two German destroyers actually approached the HMS Sheffield at HMS Jamaica, thinking that they are friendly ships because the visibility was just so poor that they mm -hmm. found their, uh, basically, they found their mistake only when they uh, were under a deluge yeah. of uh, six yeah. inch shells. So that was. Yeah, there are, there are a number of different occasions, and it occurred during PQ 17 and PQ 18, where uh, they only realized they were facing enemy surface ships when they had challenged them with flashing light and asked them to identify themselves. And yeah, and you've got to remember as well, though, over the scale that these engagements are taking place at, bearing in mind gun ranges multiple miles, even going into double digits, the when you've got the, all these ships scattered out, it's not just a case of the weather is this. It may be that the weather for a destroyer that's two miles off the stern of the convoy is complete non visibility. The weather at the other end of the convoy might be perfectly clear, and there there be a sort of a bank of fog or snow or sleet or whatever halfway down, and this will be replicated in patches all over the place. So you can have ships appear, disappear, 
one ship might be perfectly visible, the next ship might be completely hidden. So you're um, saying World of Warship spotting is uh, historically accurate? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, plus, uh, there's also, especially when the sea was calm, which actually it was in the case of PQ-17, there, that's a point that many of the participants uh, took, that basically the, the sea was completely flat like a glass that, uh, that made it actually hell for submarines initially, because it's like you can see the periscope from miles away. Uh, but there was also uh, the polar mirage, Basically, over this huge flat cold surface, you had a lot of optical illusions. So, uh, for example, when uh, the Corvette HMS Lotus returned back to search for survivors of the convoy, uh, they actually spotted a life raft at uh, several miles, thanks to the Mirage, while the sailors on the life raft were thinking that they are basically lost because the yeah. smoke cans they popped the smoke was just spreading across the water, but the Mirage saved them. So basically you have all sorts of weird things happening at uh, at these places. Yeah. Um, there was a question I found quite interesting from Bene, uh, 1994, was yeah. asking, why did the Allies not use more carriers in the Arctic to fill the air cover gap instead of sending them to the Atlantic where there was no German air power? Well, carriers aren't just for uh, providing air, air cover. Uh, and defending against air attack because the single best way of spotting a submarine which was the major threat in the atlantic is with an aircraft uh the aircraft can see obviously they're higher up so they've got a, a, this, a i mean somebody was saying what's what's visible range at sea and i said 20 miles it's 20 miles if you're on the surface it can be 60 miles if you're a thousand feet up um and you can see you, you, the submarine cannot travel on the surface if there are aircraft overhead because you'll see the wake from miles away which the, pr the presence of aircraft over the Atlantic convoys meant that submarines were forced to stay submerged during the day, which cut their speed down by two thirds, um, which was a massive factor in preventing them from getting into position and attacking convoys in the first place. So yeah, I'm sure they would have loved to have had carriers for everyone, but they just didn't have enough and they needed them everywhere. Yeah, and it's also about the, the utility of operation because I mean, the Atlantic's not exactly a pleasant place to be operating in, but compared to the Arctic, it's a walk in the park. Um, all these issues that we've talked about with visibility of ships, they apply pretty much to aircraft as well. Because if you, you could launch an aircraft in the middle of a nice, calm, clear, open day, but if that aircraft goes off 100 miles away, comes back and discovers the entire convoy and its carrier is now covered in a 300 foot high bank of fog, what's it going to do? It can't land. It can't see anything. And yeah, good luck surviving if you have to ditch if you're in if you're wearing pilot gear in the middle of the Arctic, um, and that's without the storms from render your carrier pretty much non-operational because it's doing this all the time, which is not really conducive for flying off. Um, you've got the ice. The ice is going to affect aircraft even worse than it's going to affect ship structures. So you can't really keep the aircraft out on deck, as assuming you don't also don't get them washed or blown off. Um, even if you have them in the carrier itself, you bring them up onto deck. If the deck's covered in ice, well, good luck taking off or indeed landing. Um, and as we mentioned, the Germans have significantly more aircraft present, which means that whereas out in the middle of the Atlantic, you can put swordfish and, and all sorts of things, and they'll quite happily take chunks out of the U-boat fleet all day. If you send a couple of unescorted swordfish or albacores up west of Bear Island, the Germans are just going to show up with Messerschmitts and, right. and shoot but, down but, your aircraft. You've only got limited yeah. numbers on your they, carrier. They don't even have to show up with Messerschmitts. They can turn up in a JU-88 and it's still going to get the job <laughs> That'd done. That'd be an interesting Albert dogfight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, well, yeah. Without, yeah. yeah. I, I think uh, an HE-115 would probably stand a decent yeah. chance against an Albacore. Yes. Yes, definitely. And uh, there's also a question of what carriers, because basically fleet carriers, you can't really tie them to the convoy because they are just too juicy a target for submarines. Yeah. So they have to stay with the distant cover and uh, actually cover the distant cover against uh, planes and submarines. But escort carriers at that time of war, they were mostly improvised. They were not yet the like uh, uh, custom built uh, uh, book Ka class and Kaiser stuff. Kaiser coffins, cheap yes. carriers. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, for example, the uh, uh, which one was it with PQ-18 Argus? No, uh, Avenger uh, carried only eight planes, I believe. Yeah. 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 So that, that's... basically, that's not enough to provide uh, combat air patrol against bombers. So the carrier is basically a sitting duck against enemy air raid. Yeah. 
all you can do is basically send out the swordfishes to chase submarines. But yes, that's it. Yeah, yeah and okay. e e even if by some magical chance you've somehow lucked into having eight hellcats or eight wildcats or martlets, as they would have been called at the time, again, you're sailing off off the coast of an occupied country where there's a lot of Luftwaffe aircraft, even if you've got eight of the best naval fighters available at the t p period, the Germans can show up with two dozen. Or two. And that's it. Okay, let's uh, move. I, guys, I can see lots of questions on Twitch. We'll, we'll do a few more of the, the questions where you guys submitted, and then we'll, we'll move back and um, uh, chat to you guys in chat, right? So... Captain Jay is asking, what was the state of ultra intercepts at this point in the war? Sure, by mid-20, if 1942, they were reading some Enigma messages or not. Some uh, is a keyword. <laughs> German naval Enigma was the one that was the hardest to keep keep cracking and keep yes. track of. Um, the G German naval Enigma, remember, was the one that introduced the additional rotor. Yeah. Um, well, Ger German... Was it four yes, rotors instead four of four? Four rotors, yeah. yeah. The, the the German, although German signal security wasn't the best um, due to some of the blind spots they had about being convinced that Enigma was un, near enough uncrackable, of the various German military commands, the German naval signal security was probably a step above that of the army and the Luftwaffe. So by 42, yeah, you're getting some message intercepts, but when you're getting them both in terms of if you're getting them at all and also how long it's taking you to decode them yeah it's a the, little the, little the, bit of a pot the, the speed of decoding um don't be fooled into thinking that you know okay we've cracked the code run it through the computer and four minutes later it spits out a transcript of a decoded message no it would still take many many hours um even if you had fragments of the cipher it would take many many hours for the uh it was bizarre actually they called the the, um, the bomb the bomb they called them the bombs yeah. <laughs> that was the name they used for the computers massive um analog computers that they used to actually decode these things which the americans once they got in on the act industrialized on a massive scale uh, and proved to be far better at decrypting than we could ever be just because we couldn't build as many things as, as many other things as the americans could um an often overlooked part of the success of uh, decrypting German signals intelligence was where the signals intelligence wasn't actually being decrypted at all. But uh, Drac alluded briefly to uh, communications discipline. Um, often you could tell because... It, <laughs> They'd, they'd start and finish the finish the messages with the same things, right? And yes, like yeah. sometimes just finish everything or, or just, finish with Heil Hitler or start with yeah, yeah. the weather's are, clear and you know, yeah. The, the messages that they were sent once they'd been grouped up were, were sent via Morse code. And you could recognize an individual operator yes. by the way they sent that Morse code. So if you knew what somebody sounded like, if you knew that the radio operator on the turpits was sending there was a fairly good reason that the Turpins was up to something. A fairly good reason. A fairly, you can make a fairly educated guess that the Turpins was up to something. And just the volume of signal traffic that was being generated from certain sources, if you knew where it was coming from, and there was a sudden massive increase in signal traffic in Trondheim, for example, it's entirely possible that the German destroyer force was up to something. You didn't yeah. need to actually be able to decrypt the message in order to get an awful lot of information from just the raw signal data itself. And if you had uh, such a buildup of uh, message traffic and then suddenly silence? Yeah. That means that, that something is really, really hanging right over you. Okay. Yep. Next question was why did PQ seventeen fail so badly and could there have been something been done about this? Well, I think why yeah, we've I, gone I, into I, the I, why I think we yeah. touched it, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> now now Drakinifel, you're the admiral in charge. What would you have done to 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 do it better? Well, as I say, the the problem is is how much information do you actually have to hand? It's with especially with these kind of counterfactuals it's incredibly difficult to make the call in in, in some circumstances it's much easier because in some circumstances oh, excuse me the the Sorry. admiral in charge or whoever has a lot of information to hand they just interpret it wrong or they actually make a call that's relatively speaking correct and luck goes against them with this there's so little information they actually have at the time and it's so scattered that with, to, to try and second guess at any given point, even hour by hour, how it's 
how you could realistically change things is going to is always going to be changing on, on on that constant basis um and i mean yeah in in theory you might say well actually we should just press the the the, the big heavy escorts we should just take them with us further then we're even if turpit shows up doesn't matter really we, we'll fight it and hope that we should win with the preponderance of force we've got but this um if you're a really aggressive admiral you might think yeah i'll do this but then you're going to get hauled onto the onto the carpet by your superiors saying to you all well, why on earth did you just send two battleships and a carrier into the teeth of the luftwaffe because it's not just a case of we will do this to secure against turpits it's what are the germans going to do in response um mm -hmm. and it, it may not even be something they do in response it may be something as relatively mundane as yeah we'll we'll keep victorious in in near company for longer and then luftwaffe ju88 wandering along looking for a convoy looking for something to attack gets lost in cloud can't find anything wonders what's going on pops out of a cloud finds itself sitting right above victorious now what <laughs> this is the yeah. kind of stuff that can happen in this kind of in this kind of environment it's yeah, look at bismarck yeah, yeah, to be honest, yeah. I mean, to be honest, Bismarck is a, the, the whole operation there is so much easier to counterfactual than the Arctic convoys because, as I say, the amount of the amount of variables in play and the amount of information that we know the various officers had to hand is a lot more stable. With the, with the Arctic convoys, as I say, it's, I, I wouldn't want to try and second guess them purely on the basis that anything i say you could easily say well yeah but if you made that call an hour earlier that'd be the wrong call or if you made that call at that time how are you making that call because you don't actually have that information until three hours down the line okay yeah, there's also the fact that basically the the turpits return to we i think we will get to it uh, in the next question like uh, exactly how it returned but uh, it returned uh, for one because it was spotted but also because by that time the recon planes reported that the convoy is scattering so like the german high command realized that like it doesn't make sense to have turpits chasing after single ships yeah. yeah although we do have another expert handy who so far has had a chance to answer a question alexa what went wrong with convoy with convoy 17. <laughs> alexa doesn't appear to have an opinion on the subject <laughs> <laughs> it's it's Let me ask her again. I don't oh. know that. What <laughs> use are you, Alexa? Seriously, come on. Never mind. She, she was, was so talkative earlier. She was so talkative earlier. Yes. Ser Alexa, tell me about Convoy PQ-17. This might answer your question. According to Wikipedia, a convoy is a group of vehicles, typically motor vehicles or ships, Alexa, traveling together. Shut up. <laughs> Okay, um, let's move on in the program. Yes. Uh, next question is from Sound and Fury, and he's saying it's, it's been it has been speculated. Alexa. <laughs> <laughs> Women. <laughs> so it has been speculated in Soviet literature that Tirpitz was forced to turn around and return to port after being torpedoed by a sub K twenty one. As far as I understand, the evidence is quite firm that this is not what happened. But could you comment on what are the most convincing arguments that make this speculation false? Also, how likely would it be for a Soviet sub or a World War II era sub in general to score torpedo hits on a fast bottom ship like Tirpitz in that situation? Well, That's well, a question the, and a half. Well, the, the the evidence that it didn't happen is well, absence of a hole. <laughs> yeah, that the, the Tirpitz stayed operational and stayed in Norway. If if Tirpitz had been hit by one or more torpedoes, then were not the facilities at its anchorage at that point to make anything like adequate repairs to keep it an operational frontline warship it would have had to be relocated and there's absolutely zero percentage in the germans hiding that because what they're going to do they're going to keep a, a half crippled battleship sitting in a fjord as a paperweight for for a while at this point they've still got a number of other heavy ships that pose a threat so they well not that they'd want to but they can and would have taken it Further, either further south or all the way back to Germany for repairs, depending on exactly how bad it was, whether it hit right amidships on the torpedo defense system, whether it hit somewhere slightly more vulnerable. Um, so the fact that Tirpitz stayed around is pretty much the, the, the opening and closing argument for whether or not it got it got hit by a Russian torpedo. But on the flip side, 
whether or not that could in theory have happened from from any sub yeah it definitely can um because you just have to be it, lucky right you, yeah, you just you're have in the, the submarine right, turbines yeah, right, driving past and you're going to shoot torpedoes yeah right, right in... place right time and also you've got to bear in mind what exactly is turpids doing because I mean, it might be modern and fast but if it's cruising along 18 20 knots nice straight line trying to get home in good time it's yeah. if you're in the right place at the right time for a submarine commander that's a dream shot it's dead easy yes. if turpids knows you're there and it's now going high speed and zigzag that's a completely different matter but turpids wouldn't have been expecting that and yeah, look, look what happened the to the Japanese fleet carriers okay. yeah. when, you know, like yeah. there was a submarine just happened to be there. You, know, you can accuse the Germans of a lot of things, but being stupid generally wasn't one of them. And they are fully aware of exactly when the Turpus was most vulnerable to torpedo attack and would probably, I mean, I don't know for sure, but I would have been astonished if they hadn't taken measures to, to safeguard against it. I mean, you know that they would have had a submarine boom, submarine net um, across the mouth of the fjord where the Tirpitz was was laid up there would have been patrols out sweeping for uh, for submarines um it it wouldn't have been easy but then again it wasn't easy to sneak into scarpa flow and sink the royal oak and yet they, yeah. they still managed to do it so not out of the question but highly unlikely uh, but on the other hand what the k21 did achieve I mean the torpedo attack was unsuccessful but uh, she sent a sighting report which is uh, even probably more important than the actual torpedo attack. Especially since uh, while the Soviet Navy didn't really pass this sighting report along, the Germans didn't know this and they, like, they detected sighting reports. So, okay, they know, know about us. Then Trippis was spotted by a flying boat from the RAF and then by a British submarine. And all those two, uh, two more sighting reports help to convince the high command that okay they know about us the convoy is scattering why should we risk their bits yeah why would i scatter i wouldn't scatter uh, that's uh, that that's uh, something what the german commanders didn't understand really at all that was like no, that you didn't get why are they doing this <laughs> Okay, let's move on. Uh, next question. Guberio is asking, how much truth do you think there is in the common theory that the Admiralty's disastrous decision to scatter PQ-17 and the almost panicked orders to do so was heavily influenced by the possibility that the first joint Anglo-American operation under British command might involve the destruction of American as well as British units? I think it is likely that it was a factor. And Churchill also thought that it was a factor. In fact, I have what he had to say on the subject right here. Admiral Pound would probably uh, not stop, have stop, sent... stop, 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 stop. If you're going to read Churchill, you're going to have to at least try and make an attempt <laughs> yeah. at Churchill. <laughs> Admiral Pound would probably not have sent such vehement orders if only our own warships had been concerned. Is this good enough for you? Excellent. Yes, excellent. But the idea that our first large joint Anglo-American operation under British command should involve the destruction of two United States cruisers, as well as our own, may well have disturbed the poise with which he was accustomed to deal with these heart-shaking decisions. So Churchill thought that it was a definite factor, and I, I don't know if it was the factor, um, but it was almost certainly something that influenced Pound's thinking. I mean, you had the, the Wichita and the Tuscaloosa in the uh, distant covering force, not the heavy covering force. We had the USS Washington and the heavy covering force. Uh, they were both heavy cruisers. Uh, Wichita was uh, one of class. Uh, Tuscaloosa, I believe, was in New Orleans. Yes. Um, you know, the they only were... New Orleans to survive 1942 without combat damage, by the way. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah, because Dudley Pound ordered the ships to scatter. <laughs> so... <laughs> But yes, um, I, I'd say it was it was a factor. I don't think it was the factor, but it was certainly probably weighing quite heavily on his mind at the time. Yeah, I, yeah. I would say he probably didn't really... Uh, the fact that the ships were American didn't really weigh that mu as much on his mind as that basically it would be uh, two heavy cruisers lost. Yeah, I mean, it's, got, it's, it's... Yeah, I think it comes down to that. It's what ships are at risk in terms of what type of, of vessel, not necessarily the flag they're flying under, because... If, if the, all of this had been happening two or three days earlier when there was a much greater chance of getting the, the heavy forces in, I don't think Admiral Pound would have blinked twice at sending Washington chasing after Tirpitz. Oh, no, he would have leapt at the opportunity. That's exactly <laughs> what the heavy covering force was for. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, yeah, it's, I think it's more about 
just as you as as you say, it's, we lo- there's a strong possibility of losing a va- valuable heavy ships to li- heavy cruisers to little or no benefit. The fact that they are also American vessels is an additional complication, yeah. but it's not the primary one. I think it would have been an additional comp- complication that weighed more heavily on the politicians than the admirals. But then the admirals serve at the whim of the politicians, so in that respect, it would have been an influencing factor. Okay. Um, so we are at the end of our allotted stream time. I'm happy to keep going a little bit longer because uh, I think we still have yeah. a few interesting questions to go through. Um, but you guys happy? Yes? Sure. Yeah. I can't stick around yeah. for too much longer. I need Sac- to have my dinner. <laughs> but sacrificing yeah, we'll, we'll answer a few more. Yep. Okay. The jingles, when, when you get, uh, you just let us, let, send us subtle signals. Yes. We'll, we'll he- he- hear your stomach rumbling. <laughs> when, I st- when I start chewing my own arm off, you know, I probably need to go for a, for a dinner. Okay. Break. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, next question. It's a long one again. I'm going to have to concentrate for this one. From Gamers Tank. So, after attempting to do my homework on this action, I wanted to ask you fine gentlemen two short questions. The heavy covering force con- covering the convoy included the aircraft carrier Victorious, battleships Duke of York and Washington, cruisers Cumberland and Nigeria, and nine destroyers. Their position was northwest of Bear Island in anticipation of resistance to the convoy's advance. Why didn't the Victorious launch fighters to provide cover when the German bombers, torpedo planes, and submarines arrived? My second question is, let's say all of the rumors behind the turpids are true. The German Navy puts every ship at their disposal to attack the convoy. What are the chances of German success if the covering forces stay and fight it out? Can I take the one about the victorious launching fighters? Yeah. Yes. Um, 350 miles away. What's the endurance of uh, Grumman Martlet? And is it going to, and how many can it launch? Bearing in mind that the Luftwaffe were sending air raids of 80 aircraft at a time. Uh, to attack PQ-17. So let's say that you are lucky enough to arrive over the convoy with your fighters at the precise moment when it's under attack, which you would need to be because you wouldn't have the endurance to hang around waiting for an air attack to develop, and you'd be largely ineffective anyway because there'd be so few of you compared to the the, to the yeah. number of shin volume of incoming aircraft. Um, and you'd miss the next raid anyway in the time it took you to return to the carrier, rearm, refuel, and come back. So it wouldn't have helped. Yeah, an escort carrier in the middle of the uh, convoy might have helped a little, but as Drac mentioned, the escort carriers that were available at the time, in fact, the next convoy, PQ-18, had the uh, escort carrier Revenger, which only had eight aircraft on board anyway, and those aircraft were far more valuable um, in hunting down submarines than they were for defending the convoy from air attack. So it just wasn't practical. Yeah. And in terms of if, if the Germans are just gone, you know what, we're all in, we're sending everything. It, it would have been an interesting fight, but it, it still would have been the Allies fight to lose because they would have had two full proper battleships. If they joined the cruiser covering force up with the, the, the heavy covering force, they actually now match heavy cruisers for heavy cruisers and the Allies have light cruisers on top of that and they will have more destroyers and they will have uh, the aircraft from victorious and although as we just said the fighter is not particularly useful against the Luftwaffe attacks torpedo strikes against the the heavier german ships i mean a useful if they hit b even if they don't hit very useful at breaking up their formations um and at this point the allies do have an advantage with more advanced more advanced radars and such like so if 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 the germans had rolled all the dice and sent absolutely every ship they had in norway after it it would have been a very close and very messy fight and there definitely would have been heavy losses on both sides but the allies do have the preponderance of firepower and technology at that point and Um, well it would have been the single largest in surface action of world war ii yeah and but it wouldn't have stopped pq18 and in actual fact, at that point, you would have had a lot fewer merchant ships, a lot uh, losses, a lot, a lot of warships yeah. would have died, and it would have been one of those things that we everyone talks about for for the next eighty years. But weirdly enough, the, the, most of the merchant ships probably would have been fine. Yeah, and there wouldn't have been a Tirpitz, uh, Hipper, Shear, and Lutzow around to threaten PQ eighteen, which would have had to worry yeah. about air attacks and submarines and nothing else, uh, and had a heavier covering force. And then you have to worry about where where else gets visited by six one seven and all those wonderful talk boys if Turpitz isn't around. Yeah, I, I think they would have found some suitable target. Yeah, there's always something to blow up. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Okay. And in World War Good, good, um, good question. Uh, next question from Rack here. 
as PQ17 had 13 out of 36 surviving. That's incorrect. It's actually 11 out of 35. But uh, in September, um, PQ18 with stronger escorts had 27 out of 40 make it to Archangel. What was the risk level allies were willing to take, adding that the Russians gave no help in protecting convoys? Uh, this is a question that uh, Winston Churchill answered before PQ16. Uh, when he remarked that basically if the convoy gets through with 50% uh, losses, it's a good thing. <coughs> uh, because that's another factor, basically the British were aware that the summer is coming, so basically the endless daylight. So they, they knew that the convoys will be very risky and they wanted to stop them. Sorry. <coughs> Yeah, that'd be you've got yeah. just covering for Tucker while he's clearing his throat. Is that you've got, <laughs> you do have to factor in that after these these disasters, there was a suspension of summertime convoys. Yeah, they, they had happened before. They weren't going to happen again for a long while after this. So, mm. it did. Although there, for all the reasons we've been discussing for the past couple of hours, there are a lot of factors that go into this particular incident. The end result of it was that the Allies did actually say, "Well, this uh, this block of." time is actually too risky for us unless and until we can either reduce the german threat or increase our own coverage or ideally both okay uh, there was actually even uh, because after pq17 there were no convoys for a prolonged time basically until between september and december uh, so in uh, end of october there was operation fb which was kind of a desperation operation uh, where 13 merchant ships were sent from iceland to ussr under cover of darkness, basically alone. They were sent in uh, half-day intervals. And uh, out of the 13 ships, three returned because of the weather damage, and uh, five were sunk. So only five made it through. Oh, that's pretty pretty bad odds. Yeah. Um, there was oh, yeah. one... Yes? Yeah? Go. I was just going to say, uh, after PQ-17, do you want to hear the telegram that Churchill sent to Stalin? Yes. Uh, in Churchill voice, please. No. <laughs> yeah, I, come on. Chat loved it. it. I loved it. No, 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 no. All right, all right, all right. Here we go. My naval advisors tell me that if they had the handling of the German surface submarine and air forces in present circumstances, they would guarantee the complete destruction of any convoy to North Russia. They have not been able so far to hold out any hopes that convoys attempting to make the passage in perpetual daylight would fare better than PQ-17. It is therefore with the greatest regret that we have reached the conclusion that to attempt to run the next convoy, PQ-18 would bring no benefit to you and would only involve dead loss to a common cause. Stalin's reply <laughs> basically said, balls to that, send the next convoy, regardless of the losses. PQ-17 was sent with a vastly stronger covering force and suffered almost as bad losses, at which point Churchill said, Bollocks to you, Joseph. No more daylight convoys. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Jingles. See, that was it was worth it. Next question from Higgins JF H1072. Great nickname, dude. How do you feel about the role that the Corvettes played in PQ17? And do you think they could be good for anti-submarine warfare in World of Warships? Uh well. Ah, dinner, dinner is served. I think there solves your ah. hunger problem. <laughs> So, 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 so I guess this is uh, probably the... No, we're going to watch Jingles eat now. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. <laughs> Jingles Ooh. is being fed. Ooh. Pasta, meatballs, chorizo, and lots and lots and lots of cheese. Uh, sounds lovely. I'm uh, getting hungry now. Uh, so yeah, the, the Corvettes of the PQ-17 had... Uh, made a useful job before the convoy dispersed. Uh, after it dispersed, it came to basically... Uh, nobody really knew what exactly does the scatter involve. So th there were captains who uh, preferred to really go it alone. There were uh, captains who tried to form mini convoys. And there were escort ships uh, basically there were two anti-aircraft uh, escort ships as the biggest uh, units uh, whose commanders thought that it's their duty to save as many of the light escorts as possible because they knew that like if they uh, were to face off turpits uh, they are completely useless with their four inch pop guns 
so they basically formed most of the corvettes and uh, lighter escorts into two groups and headed for uh, the safety of Novaya Zemlya. Uh, one of the corvettes of this mini convoy, the HMS Lotus, uh, uh, her commander changed his mind after receiving distress call after distress call, so they turned back and uh, saved quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of uh, merchant sailors in the end. But uh, most of the corvettes uh, basically beelined it to uh, to the Novaya Zemlya and then got uh, without much incident to Arkhangelsk. Uh, just to then go out again and escort back the surviving ships, basically in two mini convoys between the Novaya Zemlya and the Russian ports. The thing you have to remember about corvettes um, is that their value isn't really in their effectiveness. I mean, they're armed with a single three or four inch gun and lots of depth charges. Um, and to a degree, they are very, very good escorts against submarines. Um, they're, they're, they're excellent bang for the buck. But it's the buck rather than the bang, which is what makes corvettes so good, because they are so incredibly cheap and you can build them so incredibly quickly. And they are pretty effective for the amount of money that they cost. But they're okay. not they're not particularly brilliant anti-aircraft vessels, which nope. was the biggest problem, as yeah. it turned out. And uh, yeah, no number of corvettes is ever going to be able to take on the turpits unless the turpits happens to miss one and run it over shortly, followed by uh, the entire depth charge rack detonating. Which I suppose with Punjabi is yeah. te the, technically possible, but um, I don't know. The, you probably need like a D1000 to roll to for that one. To answer the yeah. final part of that question, how effective do you think they'd be in World of Warships? Well, if you want to play World of Warships in a ship with uh, 5,000 health that's armed with a single three inch gun and a mm. bunch of depth charges, you're a braver man than I am. <laughs> yes. Yeah, try uh, taking a crippled tier two destroyer out into a tier eight game and see how long you last. That'll be about the same experience. Yeah. But uh, basically what you mentioned with the depth charges against Turpids, that's actually one of the A-team style shenanigans that the crew of the Troller Airshare Air uh, did, because uh, mm. I, I mean it was partially probably make work just to make the crew think about something else that, than having Turpids potentially coming right to them. But the commander of the Troller had the crew uh, tie uh, depth charges to empty fuel barrels. Uh, to basically create improvised mines that he intended to throw of his stern in case the turpits came calling. So it was a very, very, very desperate measure. <laughs> cool. Let's head over to the next question. Yeah. Um, Shrank58 is our, says, uh, the reality is that the book most people have read about this event is David Irving's work. Considering Irving's poor reputation as a historian, is there a good modern account? I think who 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 has I I I have uh, I have to confess I haven't read David Irving's book so I I couldn't answer the first part of that question the second part of the question however I can answer because the book that I read in preparation uh, for this very stream is called The Road to Russia Arctic Convoys 42 to 45 uh, by Bernard Edwards and it's excellent um all kinds of eyewitness accounts from the survivors um transcripts from the reports uh particularly there was a report no that all focus is practically drunk uh a, a, you, a report. you know you can switch that off right i can't i've tried trust me uh my webcam is no longer officially supported in windows <laughs> so there's no control panel settings for it okay okay this is this is somebody in jingles youtube viewers send a mini webcam please <laughs> but anyway yeah um that book that I just mentioned that I've already forgotten, <laughs> very very good. Not just doesn't just talk about the convoys, talks about what happened at the other end when they got to Murmansk, uh, which is a bit of an eye opener as well. Uh, but something that I suspect we're probably running out of time and won't have the opportunity to discuss in much detail. No, um, let's uh, look at one I'll more question. Quickly, I will yes. quickly drop my recommendation because that was also an excellent book, oh. uh, the Ghost Ships of Archangel by uh, of Archangel by William uh, Garou. Probably, uh, probably with English pronunciation, uh, which covers uh, basically it focuses on the mini convoy of Ayrshire and the free merchant ships, but it covers the background of the convoy, especially of the PQ-17, but the general background of the Arctic convoys, and it uh, provides a very, very vivid descriptions of actually like weather and uh, all the issues connected with it. So I can recommend that one. 
Cool. Um, let's do let's do one more question, right? Yeah. Then we'll call it. I think mm -hmm. Jingles Jingles really wants to finish his pasta. So, question is from Hills Caretaker. How effective were U-boats operating long distances, such as near the United States? Incredibly <laughs> effective, and you can thank Admiral King for that one. Yes. At least at first. I mean, it, it depends greatly on exactly which kind of U-boat you're talking about. Because if you're going to take an early model Type 7, you're basically like, oh, the American coast, that's nice. Um, better head home. Um, it's yes. a little bit glib, but it's near enough. Um, whereas if you're taking a Type 9, much bigger, longer range, more capable for that kind of operation, then, yeah, then you're going to be, as as Jingle said, as Admiral, thanks to Admiral King, you're going to be very, very effective. Um, so, yeah, it depends on the, the not only the, the mark of you boat, but also where along the production line it is, because obviously late, later Type 7s are different capability, later Type 9s different capability. You've also got the resupply U-boats. The Germans would eventually set up in the middle mid-Atlantic for a while, so that would extend... Milk uh, cows. Yeah. The, but what's the... Uh, Conway, I'm sure you can give us the proper German name for them. Milchkühe. That's the one. So, yeah. So all of these factors, um, it's, it's going to depend time, submarine type, what support has it got, and what exactly are the Americans doing? Um, best case scenario, you're off there, uh, off the coast with a Type 9, nice un undisturbed travel over and all the uh, coastal cities are lit up. At which yeah, happy city, days. Lights, city lights blazing because nobody's enforcing a blackout. Ships just sailing around yeah. wherever because Admiral King's refusing to form them into convoys because that's British thinking, damn it. <laughs> and at, so which, on, yeah. so at which point it's like, well, how many torpedoes and how many rounds for your deck gun do you have? That gives you an approximate idea of how many targets you can take out. The flip side to that is a year or two down the line, you so much as pop a periscope anywhere near New York Harbor and suddenly you discover the sky has turned into aluminium. Um, <laughs> and there's a lot of very, very angry people with a, with a nice white star on a blue roundel who are very keen to make your acquaintance. Yeah, there's a reason why they called it the second happy time when they started uh, attacking yes. shipping along the eastern seaboard of the USA. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I know we didn't answer all of your questions, but I think we did a good run of it. I really hope you enjoyed this. Um, we do this, you know, we do this for you. Um, because we think that naval history is interesting and, um, you know, like we think it's worth remembering, not just in, in World of Warships. So please do me one favor if you haven't yet. Find Drakinefell and find The Mighty Jingles. Subscribe to them on YouTube. Donate all of your money, some of your money to them. <laughs> um, I'm sure they have like merchandise you can buy or whatever. Um, all, all, all of their money. <laughs> all, all, all of your money. You, exactly. you were right the first time. <laughs> yes. Um, but most of all, um, get, show, show, show them your love if, if, you, if you do love them, and I'm, I'm sure you do. Um, from my side, uh, thank you very much. The next Armchair Admiral stream will be taking place, uh, barring any unforeseen boat barbecue extravaganzas, uh, on the 28th of August, 2020. So in Ooh. one month and one week. Trust us, they said. We're Germans. We can organize this. <laughs> Look. <laughs> oh, oh, oh yes, yeah, guys. Until, uh, sorry, there was. <laughs> yes, but then there was my boss who decided, hey, this is a perfect day to throw a barbecue. Yes, but he's German as well. No, he's not German. What, His mean? boss. Oh, right. Okay. Yes, he's Finnish. Take it. <laughs> That's so, nice. um, so, 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 yes. Uh, so, we will be thinking of you on the boat next week. Um, and from my side, I guess that's almost it. Um, we do have a little bit of a sellout. You have a few more minutes to redeem the bonus code. Um, it is a Drahtesel, German for wire donkey, also known as a bicycle. Um, it gives you a mission in game that will give you um, a German destroyer container if you are good enough to complete it. It's a bit spicy. Um, good luck. Um, then the other thing I wanted to mention is we do have a Teespring store now. Um, we didn't launch this Teespring store because we want to get um, filthy rich of selling t-shirts. We don't. We've made the prices um, very, very, very cheap and we've cut our profit margins for some of them basically to zero because we're doing this because you guys said you want t-shirts and well, if you want t-shirts, who are we to say no? Yep. So have t-shirts. Um, if you want to find our Teespring store, you can either scroll down on YouTube or scroll down on Twitch and it'll be right there. You can, you can, you can, you can find a link to it. Um, we have some nice designs, um, including some, some face masks if you want to be responsible and uh, snazzy at the same time. 
Uh, any more selling out that we have to do? Um, I think. I think not. I think we're done. I think see out, you yes. next week on the first week. stream. Well, um, I think it's time for closing closing yes. remarks. Jinx. Um, text five. T no, oh, I got it wrong. <laughs> 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 I am so shit at selling out. Um, am I allowed to say shit? By the way, oh, too late. I've done it twice. Now. Text jingles to 500, 500 to get your free audible trial and claim Jane ha James Hornfisher's audible audiobook version of Neptune's Inferno absolutely free. That's actually a really good idea, yeah. by the way. If you like, guys, honestly, if you've never done an audible trial um, and you like naval history, this is probably a good recommendation because uh, it's a good book, yeah. um, it'll teach you a lot. It's a and, great book. But, but uh, jingles, I have to say one thing, right? Yes, I think a lot more people would be willing to do this if there was a version narrated by you. Hey, well, mm. I, I, look, I've spoken to my good friend Jim, and he's, yes. he he knows people in the publishing houses in the East Coast, and he has said that he, he'll put in a word for me and get me an audiobook gig. I'm I think that waiting. was a fantastic That's, idea, because uh, I will listen yeah. to it, and I think yes. most of most of chat would also do it, yes. Okay, uh, Drakinifel. Um, all I will say is, for those of you who understand the reference, please make all the possible benedictions to the ominous eye you can. Sacred <laughs> unguents, sacred incense, random cogs, offerings of toasters, whatever, because currently I'm doing this from my laptop, because my main PC um, is expletive deleted at the moment. <laughs> so um, within the next 24 hours, I hope to either have it fixed or have it into sufficiently disassembled into enough parts with enough violence that it makes me feel at least slightly ther therapeutic which is putting some of the <laughs> videos i wanted to release over this weekend and next at risk so you, please you uh, displease yeah. the great machine spirit yeah will, is the only side cross my fingers also also chat cross your fingers that my indomitus box does indeed arrive tomorrow <laughs> um closing remarks for mr mr taki well it's been fun I'm looking forward to the next month's uh, installment. We will have to brainstorm which will be the topic. Yes. Any any initial thoughts about next month's topic, guys? <laughs> what's, what's our short list say? <laughs> I, I actually forgot our short list. So, uh, oh, okay. but uh, guys in the in the chat, if you have some suggestions, come to the forums, uh, to the article about the stream, and uh, provide suggestions there. Remember, it should be something that. Ideally, <laughs> happened during August. During August of World War Two, at some point, or World War One. Lots of stuff. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. Ooh, we could go back. Yes, that could be interesting. Cool, excellent. Okay, so thank you very much for that. Um, and on that vein, we are going to be launching our traditional yes. post-stream raid uh, because we have so much British power um, 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 unified here. Uh, we are going to be raiding someone else who's British. Uh, please, um, what what jingles? Copy pasta for chat. You somebody know how this explain, goes, right? Somebody explain. Oh, it's good night for me, and it's good. Night. I don't know what you're talking about. Sorry. No, no, no. no. We're gonna we're gonna give chat something, and they're just gonna spam their chat with it. Oh right. Oh, I get it. Okay. Uh, uh, since we're on the topic anyway, I think it has to be blood for the blood god. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let me just uh, type that up for you guys. Or for the you know blood god. If, if, if you're a war, if you're a forty k hipster, it could of course also be skulls. No, skulls no, no hipsters allowed here. Too late. Uh, okay. Too late. With that being said, thank you very much all for tuning in. We will see you again um, soon, um, probably next Thursday for our regular scheduled yes. live stream. And uh, until then, have a fantastic weekend. Enjoy World of Warships, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. bye.